Hello and welcome to Good Journeys with Second Mountain, the podcast that shines a spotlight on inspiring people and their inspired stories. You can join in the conversation with us on social media using the hashtag GoodJourneysPod and find us on YouTube at Second Mountain Comms. I'm your host, Ben Veal, founder of Second Mountain Comms, helping good people do good. And joining me today, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, is Mr. Nick Oldis, highly accomplished professional wrestler. Nick Oldis is a three-time World Heavyweight Champion, a broadcaster, columnist, author, and in case that wasn't enough, he also is now a purpose-driven business owner. First rising to fame as Oblivion on TV show Gladiators, Oldis would soon moved on, on to begin his career in the world of professional wrestling in the United States. Just five years after Gladiators, he had become the first British-born wrestler to ever win the World Heavyweight Championship in a major US company with Impact Wrestling in 2013. He's since gone on to become the face and standard bearer of the NWA as a two-time world champion, carrying the historic 10 pounds of gold for over 1,000 days. He's also husband to fellow pro wrestler and country music star Mickey James and proud father to his son Donovan. Welcome to the show, Nick. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Ben. That was a, an illustrious introduction. I appreciate it. Well, you've done a lot. Well, I don't know. I, I, uh, it, it, it sounds like a lot, but I always, I, I, I feel like there's, I feel like I'm, if anything, I'm still in the, I'm still in the middle if, at best. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I suppose that's a lot of people have that thing where they're sort of their own worst critic, but I, I sort of look at my stuff as like, I've, I've done okay, you know, but I set lofty goals. So I suppose I've, I've still got many that I'm trying to accomplish. Well, let's kick off then with some of those goals. So a big focus for you right now is you've recently launched your own company, Legacy Sports Nutrition. Um, what's the purpose of your business and what drove the decision to launch this company for you? Well, um, pretty much uh, parallel to my love of wrestling and my sort of fascination with becoming a wrestler was also my fascination with, with health and fitness, bodybuilding, you know, just sort of... Um, <laughs> human optimization if we want to put a pretentious term on it right like it um uh, you know call me call me crazy call me old-fashioned but when i made the decision you know at a sort of 12 13 years old whatever it was like i think i want to be a pro wrestler uh, my first thought was i better start lifting weights <laughs> i better change my yeah. body because i wasn't genetically gifted uh, in that regard i was skinny you know sort of lanky um and you know i was quite open about it with people I trusted, like my, my family and, you know, a couple of close friends, I was sort of open about, like, I think I want to do that. I want to be a wrestler. Um, and, and they all sort of said the same thing, like, well, you better start lifting weights, you know, you better, because yeah. you, don't, you don't look like a wrestler. Um, and, you know, so, and, and I just, I aspired to, to, you know, to have a, uh, I, I aspired to have an impressive physique. I wanted to, I wanted to sort of, you know, have a certain look to me and um, it never really, I suppose this was, you know, a, a blessing in terms of um, approaching it with a sort of young 12, 13 year old sort of naivety, but I never really saw it as something that was unattainable. I just, mm. I, I just went, okay, well, I'm gonna have to put the time in and, and just start doing it. You know, I was very confident that I could make that happen. Um, but you know, improving your body and stuff—it's a—it's a—it's a, a never-ending process. You know, it's—it's—it's—it's it's, it's, it's one of those things where you're uh, obviously your genetics do, you know, create some sort of limit for for you. We're all we're all we're all going to reach a certain limitation, you know, in terms of our genetics. But it's in terms of sort of the quality you can achieve uh, with what you have. It's it's a sort of never-ending process, which is something that I've always you know, enjoyed and, and very quickly I developed, uh, a, you know, the same level of passion for the body and for, you know, health and fitness and nutrition and supplementation yeah. and all of that as I did for wrestling. And so uh, I've, I looked at my life and I'm a big proponent of the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours principle. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, yeah. if you're before you can really master something, you've got to d devote 10,000 hours to it. And when I, 
started looking at you know it's it's um it's time for me to utilize more of my skills beyond just wrestling um it's you know it's unwise in an industry as tumultuous as ours and as unpredictable and you know unreliable as pro wrestling or any form of entertainment where you're a sort of independent contractor it's unwise to to put all your eggs in one basket um and so when i was sort of i've always had a passion for entrepreneurship and you know admired and studied all sorts of entrepreneurs particularly self-made entrepreneurs and i know that there's really no such thing as self-made but you, you know what i'm saying when i when i say that yeah um when i started looking at okay realistically uh play to your strengths you know that's what what else have i dedicated my ten thousand hours to and i knew that you know fitness and and wellness and supplementation was was the other thing <laughs> so yeah uh i guess i had always and i think um I had, I had, without knowing it, I had sort of studied the industry somewhat because obviously I was such a, a high consumer. Mm. Uh, so I'd been very, I, I knew what, what type of marketing worked on me and what type didn't. And I sort of surmised that I'm, if I make a, if I kind of start at least, you know, at least launch with uh, a, t a type of brand and, and a sort of range of products that would appeal to me, I feel like it would, uh, it, it would, you know, have some, some success. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much where we started. And uh, I was, I did it during lockdown. You know, it was the first time, really the first time where I'd had uh, a significant amount of time where I, you know, it was funny. We, we were all we were all in this situation, weren't we, where we were looking at things and going, mm -hmm. "Well, we don't really know what's next. Like, we don't have this thing. Of, well, in four weeks' time, I'm doing this, and in six weeks' time, I'm doing this." It was. We were all sort of left in this in this limbo of like, "Well, there's." And I, but one thing was for sure: is there was no way that I was going to, you know, waste that time and let it be unproductive. Mm -hmm. So, I started sort of doing my research and and you know, found, found my manufacturer and, you know, just started working on the, the e-com side of it and everything else. And, and, um, honestly, it was, uh, it was, it was one of those things where <clears throat> I think a lot of the time when people look at launch, you know, starting a business or, you know, stuff like that, they, it can look like this great big mountain, you know, and you say, mm -hmm. Oh my God, like, where? but actually once, you know, once you put one foot in front of the other with a couple of steps, you realize like, I oh, wasn't, anywhere near as intimidating yeah. as I thought it was going to be. Um, and then, so I, within a few weeks of, of sort of making the decision, like, okay, we're going to get this going. Um, we were, we were ready to launch at least with a soft launch. And we launched with five products to begin with. And, uh, and then we, and then we had more of a sort of serious launch at the start of 2021. And, and we've increased, you know, ever since. And I think now we're up to uh, 30 products. We've, served customers i think in about 11 or 12 different countries uh and you know we've we've had some we've had some nice growth we've still got a hell of a long way to go but it is it's profitable my intention is for uh for eventually for legacy to be the primary <laughs> the primary earner and for wrestling to be the side hustle <laughs> but yeah. we're not there yeah. yet no i mean it's interesting what you say i mean i you know as you know i also launched in the middle of the pandemic my own business um and again I, I i kind of agree with that i mean actually i it seemed like this this huge obstacle to overcome but actually you develop a brand you take it to market you have a proposition you have a niche you market it um it's it's not as complicated as perhaps you would think and i don't know about you but certainly for me kind of doing it in the bubble of the pandemic in a way made it easier because um there's something maybe to be said about launching within a virtual time where actually yeah. you can just really focus on your digital yeah. platform and just focus on what you're good at and uh, you know I, I actually found that it was it was quite yeah, it was surprisingly easy to navigate yeah. launching during a pandemic I could uh, I could see that I for me I think it was less distractions yes. I think was the key you know thing because I, I mean we're, we're talking about when it was really heavy lockdown like you weren't really supposed to go out 
unless you had to you know it was we're mm. you know we're talking that period so you know now there's there's mickey and i and donovan and we're and we're sort of sitting around just sort of you know trying to uh, out, outside of obviously uh making sure that donovan is still um you know engaged and and educated and entertained and and you know and, and nourished in that regard you know outside of that we're sort of going okay we need to we need to focus on something that we can sink our teeth mm -hmm. into so for me it was for me it was legacy for mickey it was her uh, her gore tv show with with lisa and val and and you know between us it was you know that's i think that the lack of distractions like oh I, i'm gonna go do this i'm gonna go do that yeah. i'm gonna go you know it was it was just a like you said for me especially with an e-com business um i think the other thing is that you know there's so many <clears throat> there's so many elements that you could uh, you could read a million different blogs and books and guides and you know articles <clears throat> but so much of it is just going to have to come from trial and error like mm -hmm. the thing i'm excited about now is that i've got the business to a point where it's profitable um and so you know now the real work begins because scaling is the real the real challenge you know mm -hmm. i used to think that starting a business was was tough but actually starting a business is relatively easy scaling it is is mm -hmm. hard but what's fun for me is without trying to get too far ahead of myself is sort of going wow the just uh, if now whenever i'm ready to to start something else i'm just loaded with so much more <laughs> knowledge yeah. right like of uh, you know of just little things like i use shopify but you know shopify add-ons and different services and you know things like that and i only i've i've shared a lot of that with with my peers who are involved in um you know e-com in different ways and been like oh i started using this thing and you know to do cross sales like you know like perfect example i i kept getting i kept getting pitched by different marketing companies on abandoned carts and i was going why is everyone so obsessed with this abandoned cart thing like it yeah you know and it, it, that was a, an example of where my own personal sort of consumer experience didn't didn't educate me because mm. i've never been someone who goes onto a, a an online store puts something in the shopping cart and then doesn't check out okay so to me the idea that that happens a lot was you I, know, I, I do that a lot <laughs> see, they're, they're, well perfect example see i yep. i I've never done, I can't think of a time where I have done that unless it's been where, you know, something's happened that, that requires my immediate attention. Yeah. You know? um, so there's, just, there's, there's, there's an like education, is there, in terms of the, the e prompts of, hey, yeah, this is still in your basket. Well, Are you still interested? Right. And, and mm. I, I, you know, I knew I was, I knew I was on the right track just by, by virtue of the fact that I was getting approached by all these different marketing companies. So I was like, well, I must be on people's radar at least. Cause you know, that's the other thing too, is that you realize, you know, people know everything about you. If you're in e-commerce, like there, there are ways to track everything. Um, but the, the, all these people kept, you know, hammering me about abandoned car emails. And I, finally, I, I, I start working with, with this one company and, uh, and the guy says to me, I'm, I'm very confident that, the fee that you pay me will be made up in the first month, like <laughs> just with the abandoned car emails. And I'm going like, come on. It was made up in the first week. Wow. And I couldn't believe wow. it. I was like, how many people do this? You know, but a perfect example, right? Because now it's like, if I ever launch something else, which I'm sure I will at some point, um, you know, now, now I have a sort of framework, you know, that I can, yeah you know get get to work with right away and and avoid some of those you know early missteps but it's all fun i've always tried to look at everything in that respect of, of like you you're winning or you're learning you know it's a yeah. sort of everything just sort of feeds into the sort of the richer tapestry of what you're doing yeah it's all it's all a journey and you know you've, you've got to try things and um, you've got to refine as you go along I, I i've learned so much in the last two years i've learned more in two years than i have in the last 20 years of my comms career um yeah. you know doing things like this doing the podcast now this is new to me 
it's all it's all a learning development and with each yeah. stage it's exciting and if you don't I learn, saw, you I saw a headline the other day on my uh I have I have the Amazon Alexa but I have the one with the screen and I and, and I saw it and they have news headlines flashing on it and I, I saw one that popped up that said um less uh less people than ever are continuing their education and I thought that's not accurate <laughs> just the just educating themselves in different ways yeah you mean they're not go you mean they're not paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to university mm. you know and getting themselves in an absurd amount of debt that's what you mean that you know that's not the same thing you know that like they're educating themselves in different ways because i don't think that a college course sits there and you know teaches you about abandoned car emails and you know <laughs> the ins and outs of Shopify versus, you know, um, one of the other, you know, online store providers. It's like all of that stuff's that's going to be, you know, the next generation after mine and, and, and the ones after that, you know, the educa their education process is going to be totally different. Like universities for me, higher education, I think is going to be that they, they really need to adapt, Like they need to, they really need to um, sort of get realistic about what they offer people, you know, in the modern era, because there are certain vocations, obviously, where you really, you have to, you know, you do need to be educated, you know, formally on, you know, medicine or engineering or, you know, the different things like that. But in terms of, you know, commercial or just overall skills, to, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's just, the access now is totally different. The, the playing field has been leveled in that regard. Like the, the information and the training and the, you know, the, the, the sort of ability to trial and error is there for anyone who has, you know, who, who wants it bad enough. Um, it's, if anything, it's just the barriers for entry are just, you know, have been eliminated. And that's, you know, as you say, that, that kind of feeds into that entrepreneurial drive, doesn't it? You learn as you go. Um, you, you pick up skills when you need to pick the skills up and you know that's the great thing I think about running your own company is that you can you can move in an agile way and you can ebb and flow and evolve as you need to um, I'm going to come back to legacy but I want to I want to go back take us back in time to your to your very early days so so you were you were born and raised in in Norfolk um, so a stone's throw from where I also grew up in the UK um, and you got into fitness, as you said, when you were around 12 years old and, and bodybuilding around that time. Um, what, what motivated you to do that? And how did you approach fitness and nutrition when you were a teenager? Well, I, I touched on it. Um, it, I'm, you know, it was, it was very much linked to wrestling, but I wouldn't say it was a hundred percent. I think it was, I think I, I think some, somewhere in, in my subconscious, I think I always had some aspiration um, you know, to, to get into bodybuilding. And when I say bodybuilding, I don't mean competing on stage. And, you know, like I, when I say bodybuilding that I've always used that as the, because that is the true term for using resistance training to improve your physique. You know, um, I know a lot of people hear bodybuilding and they immediately jump to like Mr. Olympia and, and just, you know, the sort of freaky oh, physiques. Mr. The, you Mr. Know. Mr. Norwich. <laughs> um, but when I'm saying I'm talking about the, uh, the activity, um, <clears throat> it's funny because I, I remember when I'd, um, my sister, you know, she's older than me. She, she moved out, you know, and then I hadn't seen her for a little while, probably, you know, a year or two. Uh, and she came up to visit and, you know, I, my body had drastically changed. So I must've been sort of uh, probably about 15, something like that. Um, Cause that's the great thing about starting young is that like you see results so quickly. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, cause your, your hormones are, are shooting up anyway. And, and then your, you know, your recovery is incredible, you know, cause you, you're just, you know, your body's producing tons of growth hormone. And <laughs> so you're just able to just recover and, you know, at such a great rate, <clears throat> which is one of the reasons why it's so, it's so funny now when you go back and you think about how they used to tell people not to lift weights, like when they were too young and it would, you know, stunt your development and this and that. And there's some truth to that if you're going to do heavy stuff that causes spinal compression or too much stress on the joints, but just in terms of like actual, um, you know, sort of uh, hypertrophic training, like 
it's I'm so glad that I did it young because the results are what motivate you. Like <clears throat> if you're an adult and you're unhappy with your physique, it's you're already starting sort of behind the eight ball because your 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 peak years of of, of hormonal response and and recovery is <laughs> is already gone. You know, so of course you are less motivated to stick with it. Uh, you know, you, I find that most of the guys I know who are, have a consistently have you know been in good shape, they started young, because the results are what motivate you. Like whenever I've helped people or you know written plans for people and stuff like that, I've always tried to sort of hammer home the idea that like you just promise me that you'll be consistent for six weeks, six to eight weeks. You know, don't don't expect to see anything in the first two weeks. Like, don't expect to see anything in the first three or four weeks. But if you if you you know get through that six seven week mark, you'll see something. But you've got to be consistent. You know, and but once you see it, then that's uh, it is. It, you know, that's what motivates you to keep moving forward. Like, you you, you know, a lot of the time, this image is is perpetuated that people look in the mirror and they hate what they see and that motivates them to go and improve it. And it's really not that like what's going to motivate people to keep going is when they see the improvement, when they go, Oh right. yeah, that is better. Like, Oh, my chest does look better. My arms do look better. My waist is tighter, you know, whatever it may be. That's what pushes you to keep going. And then you sort of reach stage two, which is when other people notice right okay you know that's why you have it's it's sort of the 80 20 principle in a different way but it's like that's why you you know a lot of people keep going you know you you you, you see like because the the sort of better shape you get into the more motivated you are to continue to improve yeah right like it's it's you know it's it's sort of exacerbating um <clears throat> anyway sorry i've gone off track but my I, I did have, I suppose now it would be called a negative body image. You know, I did have a sort of, I was, I did have, I was self-conscious about my physique. I was self-conscious that I was skinny. Um, my father was a rugby player, you know, and my older brother was naturally broader and sort of, you know, had a, a better sort of natural physique. And I was always, I was a good athlete as a kid, but I was always told like, well, you're skinny, you know, you're, you're sort of, you're not, you're not natural. You're not broad like Ed, you know, you'll have to, you know, you'll have to, you are you're, you'll have to be more about speed and this and that. It was, you know, mm -hmm. very sort of thinly veiled kind of <laughs> criticisms. Right. But, um, <clears throat> so I think that was a motivating factor, but for me, it was, uh, even, even, you know, beyond wrestling, you know, I, I've always, uh, had a, you know, I've always been a huge, I've always been a huge fan of Arnold, um, you know, and, I just always had this sort of uh, admiration and appreciation for uh, a good physique. And so I think it, well, it's funny because I never actually had any aspiration to compete in it. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that never, that never really bothered me. Um, but I did want to have a, a you know, a, a sort of commanding physical presence. Um, and so early on it was, same kind of thing very sort of i educated myself to a point like i bought arnold's encyclopedia and uh, a couple of other arnold books dave draper book i followed a lot um and then i got a subscription to muscle and fitness uh and in the beginning i bought a little argos weight set i went you know went to argos and got the little york you know yeah. barbell and dumbbell set and i had my little yeah. chart that i put on the wall in my bedroom and it was, you know, I was just, uh, had no real clue what I was doing to begin with. So I would just do every exercise on the chart every day. Yeah. <laughs> but again, when you're young and you can recover from that, like, like now you'd go, oh, don't do that. Yeah. But, when, you know, when you're 12 or 13, you sort of recover quickly. So it was like, but, um, <clears throat> and I did that probably for about six months to a year. Because you have to remember, this was, I guess this would have been about 2000-ish. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And back then, it wasn't that, you know, they, it, 
you know, kids my age couldn't go to gyms. Like you wouldn't, you weren't allowed in, you know, a lot of gyms had to be minimum. You had to be 16, you know, to go in or some places you even had to be 18. Like, or you could, like, I remember one gym, the gym at my local leisure center in Hunstanton, you know, they would let, they would let us go in, but you weren't allowed to lift weights. You could only go and use the cardio equipment. (laughs) So it's just like, well, I want to lift weights, you know, and slowly over time, I don't, I, I, I don't want to say that I helped change that uh, locally, but I do, I do think that there was, I do remember sort of vividly, there was a, a little group of us who, because I started to see results from working out at home. And I ended up like my uncle gave me a rowing machine and I ended up getting a heavy bag in, in, in the, in the garage and, and like little stuff like that. So I was sort of building out a little bit more of a comprehensive sort of home gym thing. Um, and I was doing the, you know, disgusting protein shakes. Like I hadn't really learned how to do them right. So I was just getting like the stuff from boots that was like, people, anyone who's my age remembers this. So used to, boots used to have just like one type of protein and it wasn't really, it wasn't even whey protein. It was casein protein. Um, and it was like, it was more designed for like, old people and sick people who want needed to add a bit more protein to their diet sure, you know? sure. and but i was making you know shakes with it and this thing would come out it'd be like cement you know <laughs> and i'd be choking down these horrific like chalky you know mixtures but i saw results yeah like and as i started to see results then my local gym that was like an independently owned one it wasn't a council one run um they started to let me train and there was like there was a guy there called paul who's a bodybuilder and he you know so they basically said okay you can train here but he's gonna supervise you and all that kind of thing um pretty quickly he he pretty much went to them and said like he knows what he's doing like you know he's fine you know he's 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 gonna be fine and i remember within within a few months there was half a dozen of us who you know from my year at school who were suddenly all in there lifting weights you know because it's it's, you know it's all right it, we were definitely, I think, the first generation that sort of normalized it. Like, yeah, because there was still a lot of that stigma of like, oh, you, like with sports, you know, I remember there was this, you know, still, even when I was in high school, there was, a, there was this stigma about lifting weights, like it will make you muscle bound and it will make you bulky mm-hmm. and it will make you slow and all this kind of thing. And I just never believed that. And I just, and then, you know, we all just started. And I, and I honestly, Ben, I just got to, I didn't really even really care if it did because I just, I, that's what I wanted to do, you know, yep. and I, but, <laughs> but I, I then, I then competed in national championships in swimming in 99 and then, uh, and, and in tennis, I think in 2000 and 2001. So it was like, <clears throat> but it can't be that bad, you know? Um, so, you know, uh, the, the, and this was obviously long before I, ever got into a wrestling ring i was watching wrestling well, every week yeah, without so, fail so i was gonna say i mean you're doing all this you're enhancing your body you're really facing it at any point as a i guess what are you then a 15 year old kid in norfolk near Hunstanton? Yeah. are you ever thinking one day i could actually become a wrestler i could emulate yeah. what i'm doing on tv oh yeah you already you're already oh absolutely that was, oh yeah, yeah i i've I'd 100% formulated that thought. I probably did that. I probably did that about 13 or 14, truthfully. Um, I just, you know, I just obsessed over the business. You know, I just, I I got every VHS tape I could get. I started getting, you know, reading everything I could read. And obviously this was a sort of, this was at the, the, this was still a pretty early days of, the internet wrestling community Mm -hmm. but i was you know following everything i could online and you know just trying to sort of i you know i was just a sponge but you know i started to um obviously the wwf was was my uh starting point you know Mm -hmm. as far as my education on the business um but as you know within a couple of years i was you know, sort of fully up to speed on the NWA and WCW and, you know, ECW yeah. and, and the, and the territories that had come before that. And, and, you know, 
And then a few years after that was when I really started to sort of delve into origins of British wrestling, you know, because I'd been to a couple of independent shows here and there, but I didn't, you know, never knew anything about it and always sort of found some of it a bit strange and funny. Cause I was like, who's this, you know, what, like, why do they do it like this? Or what's the point of this? You know, not knowing then that there was this whole, you know, that wrestling had this, I mean, cause I remember my dad would, would say stuff to me. Oh, I remember Mick McManus and Jackie Palo, and, you know, and I'd be like, eh, shut up dad. You know? <laughs> you know, nobody's heard of them, you know, obviously not realizing at the time, like they were household names, you know, yeah. and, 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 and go, you know, so then, I, you know, like I said, I just, when you, when you have a passion for something, you, you, you learn it without even trying, you know, and that was, that was the way I felt about the business. And I'm still learning about the business every day. I mean, I'm still, you know, like right now I'm sort of, you know, I, I, I'm delving into a lot of Mid-South, you know, because I've started to realize how great Mid-South was. And, you know, with the ability to watch it all now on Peacock and, you know, go back and find certain stuff where you, you know, and if you, and just cert, there are certain guys who I suddenly go, God, they were great. You know, or like there's, there's a lot of guys who people are only, are only familiar with their WWF work, but then you, you know, you, you, you go back, and you go find what they were doing five years before and they were, they were tearing the house down, you know, in, <laughs> in different places. So, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing about our business that you can, you never stop learning. So, uh, you know, and I think that's the same thing about um, bodybuilding and nutrition and stuff like that. Like I'm, I'm constantly trying to keep up with new, you know, trends and new ingredients like, like our, our best seller is, is uh, test X nines, our test booster. Uh, and, you know, a key ingredient in that is, is Tonkat Alley, which was, you know, 10 years ago, I, not that many people were talking about it, you know, and then suddenly it's like you read an article here and you see a, a doctor here talking about something and they go, this, this stuff is the real deal. Like this stuff's incredible and it, you know, and it's natural and it's derived from here. And, uh, you know, so it's the same, same kind of thing. You know, it's, it's a constantly evolving process. You, you know, you sort of, if you, if you love it, you stay engaged with it and, and you, you should be able to stay relevant. Yeah. And, and, and wrestling really is, I mean, it's a lifelong love affair. I mean, I, I, it's a, it's a fascinating world professional wrestling. I mean, I've been a fan for about 30 years now, um, kind of caught the bug. 92 the heydays of wwf bret hart yeah. was my guy i know he was your guy as well yeah me too um and i always say to anyone who hasn't had got any appreciation for wrestling i just say just want to just watch a bret hart match because if you want to see it in its purest art form and if you want to see genuine escapism and athleticism then just watch the stories that that man tells but yeah it's interesting pro wrestling because to be to be a fan and I'm sure to be a, a, a talent within the business. Um, I feel like I always have to justify my enjoyment to others. You always ask why, um, but which just doesn't happen with other sports or forms of entertainment. And I, I, I'm curious, really. I mean, not just only when you first got the bug yourself, but also what what do you think is key to the appeal of pro wrestling? Like, not only as a fan, but also as an athlete. Well, I think you touched on it. I think escapism is is the key word. Um, I think so. I'll, I'll tell you. I, I I heard Jesse Ventura say something similar once in an interview, uh, and and he summed it up well. Um, so I was sort of paraphrasing it, but it it very much mirrors why I fell in love with the business and why I decided I wanted to do it because. Uh, you know, like almost every kid in England, you know, you're born, you're born kicking a football around, right? And I was, you know, and I had obviously like a lot of kids, you know, fantasized about scoring the winning goal in the FA Cup final or whatever. Um, you know, but such is the standard of football that by the time you're like 13 or 14, you pretty much know whether you're going to make it or not. <laughs> you know, um, and I was not, uh, you know, and not that, not that it killed my spirit you know it wasn't like oh that's it i'm not gonna i'm not gonna make it i'm not gonna be a pro football player so i'm just gonna stop playing it wasn't like that but there was a there was something i mean and like i said i'd i'd had 
you know, some degree of success in some other sports. But honestly, the truth is I hadn't really dedicated myself to any of them. Um, and I'm not, this isn't, this isn't me trying to say I'm some sort of unbelievable talent that I could just, I, you know, I practiced and I, and I, I was very competitive. I've always been competitive, but when I look back, I go, I didn't really, you know, I didn't do all the things I did for this, for those sports. Like I didn't, I didn't watch tape. I didn't read stuff. I didn't yeah, seek out people to, you know, to coach me or, you know what I mean? I it just sort of. I just kind of did it. And when whatever level I accomplished, I went, all right, that was cool. But there was some, you know, I, I was already moving away from team sports because I didn't like the idea of having to rely on other people. Uh, it wasn't about the spotlight so much. It was more about the, you know, other people letting you down. Um, and, but I think, you know, the, the big part that's missing is the entertainment. You know, there was, for me, there was this other itch that I hadn't scratched. And it was like, well, I didn't go to stage school. You know, I grew up in docking in, you know, rural Norfolk. So it was not like, like there wasn't, you know, it wasn't a plethora of, uh, you know, arts places I could go to or anything like that. And I don't think I, I don't think I wanted to. I wasn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't articulate it at that age. You know, what I, you know, I have, I don't, and I have no musical talent. Let me just, let me just say that, I, you know, I shudder when I think back to my piano lessons as a kid, I, I begged my parents to stop, you know, to stop sending me. Um, and it, you know, and I think somewhere, and I don't, it wasn't like I had this epiphany, like, oh, this is the perfect amalgamation of all of these things. But I do think very quickly when I was watching, particularly, you know, the, the, the sort of late nineties when it, you know, when we really started to witness this huge boom period for the business, you know, you could watch any number of guys go out and hold an entire audience, you know, thousands of people in their hand just by speaking. Um, and you're seeing these sort of melodramas playing out. It's like, it was this combination that you can be an athlete and an entertainer in one because you can, you do have to train, you do have to be very dedicated, uh, and you, and you have to perform at a high level physically, but you also get to be a character, be larger than life, be a, you know, be an entertainer. Um, and that's, you know, I think most guys, most guys who get into the business and stick at it, will tell you a very similar story. You know, it's, it's, it's that sort of combination of the two, but, um, <sighs> I, I, I think for me, the whole, you know, I guess when I was younger, I would get, I would get, you know, very defensive when people tried to, you know, to say, say anything negative about the business. But as I've gotten older, I've just sort of learned to accept, like, it's not for everyone, you know, and truthfully, <laughs> there are times where I watch it now and there's stuff that I can't stand, you know, different shows. So it's yeah. like, uh, you know, th there, there's a, there's a period, I think every fan, everyone who follows the business for a long period of time, um, because, you know, that, that's the other thing you have to accept that there are people who will follow it for a while and then stop watching it. Um, mm -hmm. But for those of us who are sort of lifers, it's like, everyone's got their period where like everything was great or at least it, or at least in their mind it was you know for me mm -hmm. it was probably 98 to 2002 you yeah. know it was like everything was fantastic like i loved every single thing on the show i go back and look at some of it now and i go oof, you know yeah so apart, I think, apart from the crowds i mean that for, for, right. for pure for pure crowd reaction that was peak wasn't it really 98 right. to and, 2002 Right. And, it, and it's like, and that's, and, that, and that's how a lot of it got through was that, you know, but when you, uh, so I just sort of accept the fact that to, you know, I think Paul Heyman said it once, I, see, I might be paraphrasing, but he says something to the effect of, um, you know, if you love wrestling, no explanation is needed. If you don't like wrestling, no explanation will do. And it's sort of like, that's, that's 
very that's pretty much the, the long and short of it i think what's happened over the years is i think wrestling has been i think the credibility of the business has improved uh in terms of its overall acceptance largely because of that giant boom period because most people our generation at least have a period in their life where they were a wrestling fan even if they're not anymore so now there's a little bit of that sort of like oh yeah i love the days of dx and stone cold and the rock or mm -hmm. you know whatever it yeah. may be so even if they don't watch it now they sort of at least understand like oh you know you still watch it oh yeah fair enough yeah see i used to find that actually actually they're pretty frustrating because I, I became a fan in 92 when everyone was a fan um you know hogan trading cards and all that kind of stuff um i was still a fan in 95 when I think it's fair to say that that was a hard time to be a fan. The business yeah. was at a real creative low point, yeah. and um, you know, truthfully, getting getting pretty bullied, pretty mercilessly at school for being a fan of wrestling when everyone else had moved on, and then you get right. to ninety eight, and people turn up. Those same those same people turn up at yeah. school of Austin three sixteen t shirts. Right. Like, hang on. I remember. I remember same similar product. experience. Like, <laughs> I remember like people making fun of me because you know, because I liked wrestling, and you know, and then yeah. all of a sudden they were. Yeah, they are wrestling fans but it, too. But it's such it's such a cyclical product, isn't it? As you say, like yes. if you've been a fan for thirty years, um, you you do feel, and and it's 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 very difficult. This kind of inertia can kick in with a promotion where you feel that you've seen every storyline, you've seen every finish, you've seen every possible combination of a match you can see, um, and then it surprises you again. That's what I love about it. Every time I think it's the the, the business is going through a through a lower ebb. It, it brings me back in every time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't say with all certainty or sincerity that if I wasn't in the business, I don't know that I would have not taken a break from it as a fan. You know, if I'd have taken a different path in life, like I, I can't say with certainty that I, that I wouldn't have taken a period where I stopped watching it because I may well have. I've, I've definitely settled into a point that I, I, I really enjoy now, which is actually I spend an awful lot less time um, concerning myself with what's happening behind the scenes and a lot more time just enjoying oh, it as an escapist product. Say it, <laughs> say it louder for people at the back, Ben. Good yeah, Lord. It's, I mean, it's I, a, I, a... I, I genuinely try, I, I've tried <laughs> intentionally to get back to how wrestling used to be for me in when i was 10 years old when i would watch yeah. one hour of wwf a week and that was it and i now have my certain times so i watch certain shows i try not to get too embroiled in rumors or who's booking who yeah. or i think because the, i the like business, the surprise i think the business would be a lot healthier if more of the most ardent fans took that approach or at least at least were less engaged by the negative um you know behind the scenes turmoil type stuff because it leads to situations like we're seeing right now you know with this whole punk stuff i mean there's there's no winner in this you know i, I feel bad for everybody involved in different ways like i i can i i can you know i can i can look at i can look at it all objectively and uh and say okay he was out of line for doing this but they were out of line for doing that and he shouldn't have ever done this and you know and he shouldn't have let this happen you know but truthfully i feel tremendous sympathy and empathy for all of the people involved because it all comes from this it all comes from the same place which is this desire to to be great and to put out a great product and to and to have a relationship with the audience that that results in you know you being in a certain spot and and the company doing well and selling tickets and selling pay-per-views and selling merchandise um but i think that a lot of it is symptomatic of the culture that has that has been not just um n not just sort of popularized but really now taken a real control of the industry which mm. is this sort of we must communicate everything that's going on to, to but no we you don't you don't have to like 
that you can, you know, that it's this sort of over overwhelming. And I'm not saying those guys are guilty of it. I'm saying it's the industry as a whole. There's this, this sort of just this overwhelming uh, need for attention and gratification and credit. That's a huge part of it is that people desperately want credit, but that was my idea. I came up with this, you know, I was the first person to do this, you know, whatever, um, that it, it, you know, inevitably leads to ill feelings. And then over time, you know, people just, they've lost sight of what we're trying to do here, which is yeah. take people on a ride and create escapism. Yeah to a point where people are like, oh, I want to see the conclusion of this story. I'm going to yeah. pay to see the conclusion of it. And, you know, at its purest form, I mean, I, I that, that situation you just mentioned, I mean, I want that to be resolved as, as smoothly and as Me quickly too. as possible because all AEW, All Elite Wrestling, throughout the early days of the pandemic, uh, that got me through i'm going to be honest the business, I, the business I, is that, the whole that, business that, is suffering yeah. for, because um, of it you know but, but there was a time when you know wrestling was the only thing that continued for a period of time during right. during covid and that that security albeit you know the product was very different and it was it wasn't the same product without the fans but still having that stability and that kind of routine which has become hard baked in so many of our lives throughout the early stages yeah. of lockdown was invaluable and you know, I have a lot of brand affinity for that company because uh, you know of, of what that represented during that time and yeah I, I just I, I, I agree I mean as an outsider looking in you just have to remember the bigger picture here which is actually that you know these are all people who are trying to be the best and who all, all want to deliver a great product and I think sometimes it's maybe lost the bigger picture in terms of where we're all going collectively yeah I try not to be I try not to sound cynical you know I, I, I there, there's a lot of young guys at the NWA who pick my brains like Kerry Morton and uh, Gustavo and stuff and you know they've got you know they're great guys and they're gonna and you know Kerry especially like you know it's a it's a it's a um I take it as a huge compliment that he comes to me for advice because his father is Ricky Morton, you know, one of the greatest to ever do it, but it's like, but Ricky's one of the people who encourages him, you know, you know, go and ask him and go and ask him, go and ask her, you know, whatever. And I try not to be cynical, but I also, uh, you know, I, I've given him this piece of advice before I've said like, you know, uh, being a wrestler, you know, you, you'll love the business and sometimes the business won't love you back. Like, and you have to be okay with it. <laughs> um, but what you mustn't do is let that, then make you hate the business right like you have like because there are going to be times where it doesn't love you back um and i think that's also that sort of that speaks to the relationship with the audience too because the decision to peel back the curtain uh that happened way before i got into the business um and it was something that you know I do think was somewhat selfish. I think, I think a certain, I think considering the fact that the people who did it had already made a shitload of money from the business from a period of time where fans had a different mentality because they weren't aware of all this stuff. And I think this, there's a certain generation who, like I said, made a boatload of money and then they turned around and went, well, I can make a boatload more money by t t by telling everyone how the sausage is made. And uh, to me, I always, you know, when I, when I, you know, and I know that's a very simplistic way of saying it and there's, you know, everyone's going to have their own justifications for doing it, but it's like, I can tell you from my generation, one of our biggest frustrations is when we get guys from the generations before who kind of criticize us for, you know, a lack of desire or like, you know, not getting as over as they were and stuff. And we're going like, we're, we're, we, we started with a totally different playing field because mm -hmm. you had the luxury of people only seeing what you, what you presented to them on television. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have that luxury. Like we've got a huge portion of the audience who are already reading stuff about stuff that may or may not be happening. So their view of what you present to them is already tarnished by some sort of expectation. 
of something that may or may not happen based on a opinion of you that may or may not exist from a you know from somebody in the office or somebody in booking it you know what I mean and it's like so like immediately there's a totally different level of of um specialness you know to to what we have what we, we well, have also do, with, is... with 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 social media I mean you're you're a real person aren't you you're yeah Nick Nick Aldis you're well that I was know, one of the I know, again, this I is one of the reasons the why I decided well, but... to do that like yeah. when 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 we when we started with the NWA and we were discussing sort of what product we were going to put out to sort of you know to be unique in the marketplace that was one of the reasons why I did it because I said what's the point in doing anything else when the you know the, the what what we're trying to do is again like you said you know trying to sort of chip away all the bullshit and get back to like what is it we're actually trying to accomplish we're trying to get people to suspend their disbelief, right? Mm-hmm. Well, they already know when my birthday is, you know, <laughs> they know where I was born, they know where I went to school, you know, they, you know, they know what my favorite color is and everything else. So what what what's the point in trying to tell them all oh, my name's, you know, Bob Fritz and you know and I'm you know, you know, I'm from, you know, you know, Dallas, Texas. They, they know it's not true. So <clears throat> That was sort of part of my was it was was to go well. Why don't I start from I start with the truth, like and be very self aware. Be like, hey, look, I had a I had a decent run in TNA. I worked every position on the card. Finally, ascended all the way to the top of the card and became world champion. Um, and then it ended, and I was kind of hoping that I would go to WWE after that, and that didn't happen. So now here I am, and now I'm trying to make make a go of something else. And immediately people were sort of like, oh, he's telling us the truth. Like, he's not trying to tell us, oh, I'm this great wrestler. I'm this superstar. I'm this, you know, I'm a millionaire. I'm blah, blah, blah. And this, like, I, I said, no, I'm, I'm, I said, no, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm starting from scratch. Like, here I am, you know, and, and here's my opponent, Tim Storm. He's a school teacher. Like, he he has to have another job because you know wrestling isn't good enough to him to afford him a full-time living yeah but man he's proud of being the nwa champion oh wow okay like and so right away people were like oh i'm intrigued by this um so you know that's my philosophy of booking i guess is to the, the, to me it's like Anyone who's left based on, you know, when there are the casual fans, yes, if there was less, because if there was more mystery attached to the validity of what was going on or the, you know, I've, I've been told and, and I, I, was, I wasn't there. So obviously I can't say with certainty, but I was told a lot by the old timers who I, you know, talk to a lot and sit under the learning tree of like Austin Idol and guys like that was their, their theory on it was that, Look, in our era, most of the people, they kind of knew what was going on. But we could get them to believe that our particular feud, you know, these two guys really don't like each other. (laughs) You know, well, how do you do that? Just it's the same thing as I'm talking about. You start from a place of authenticity, you know, because the thing with wrestling is, one of the things I think has hurt the business quite a lot, and I'm sorry, we're going all over the place here, but the, um, I think something that's hurt the business a little bit is what I call everybody gets a trophy booking, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. there needs to be a pecking order. There needs to be a hierarchy. Yeah. And when promoters who are more concerned with their own ego, you know, more concerned with the brand being the draw as opposed to, no, there are there are certain people here that that have a, a level of credibility above the above above others. Um, you know, they, that's when you create a situation where now there's no there's no um, there's no sort of must see feeling, yeah. you know, because everybody's the same. What you're what you're essentially trying to do is present a whole lot of different personalities get people familiar with those personalities and the things that make them tick, the things they like, things they don't like, what they think of themselves, what they think of you, what they think of others. And over time, natural 
rivalries and matchups will present themselves. So for example, if let's just take a, let, let's tr take a really, really basic example, right? Um, if you have a Canadian character who's telling him I'm, I'm Canadian and we're so much better than Americans and we're, you know, we have healthcare and we do, we have gun control and, you know, and I'm, I, I said, because we were talking about Brett, I was just thinking about yeah. the stuff he was doing in 97, but it was groundbreaking, but it was like, mm. again, it worked because it pushed It was buttons. grounded in reality. Right. Mm. So over time, naturally, someone will emerge who's like, like a Steve Austin, who, even if he's not out and out saying, I represent all those other things, you know, I, it, but it's like, over time, it's like, you know, I drink beer, I drive a pickup truck, I kick ass and I don't take any bullshit from people. Anyone who was offended by, you know, anyone who took, yeah, anyone who <laughs> took umbrage to what the other guy was saying now get to live vicariously through what this guy is saying. And then you just kind of put them together and you sort of let it happen. If you have two guys who are smart enough and aware enough, and this is the, this is the key point, who are secure enough in their egos to allow each other to one-up each other. Where we start to see problems is, you know, is when you get people who don't ever, who always kind of want to get the last word, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like the worst wrestlers to work with are the ones who hate losing. Because it's like, well, you're in the wrong business then, right? Yeah. But it can also happen with, with interviews, promos is you get people who have to get the last word always like i can't i can't bear the idea of of you know and, and that's where social media has really made it difficult because now you know people live in this world where that that one instance happened in a vacuum and oh my god my life is going to end because someone burned me on a promo you know because someone clips that one bit and puts it on the internet and everyone goes ah look at this you got burned yeah. you know you've got to have the security to be able to go well, that's you know wait till wait till next week you know <laughs> because it's just the same as a match you know like who wants to see who would pay to see a match where one guy just beat the other guy up for 10 minutes and then pinned him you know like it's it's not the whole point well, of wrestling anyone, anyone who's watched a Brock Lesnar match for probably the last 10 years <laughs> but uh, in fairness so you say that but then one of Brock's most memorable matches was Goldberg and he lost in two minutes True. Because every, because everybody because no that's one saw the that coming. Right. Yeah. And you because a character like Brock Lesnar is much more credible. So he doesn't do he doesn't do 50-50 with everybody because it wouldn't be realistic. You know, like just because there's a thing with wrestling. I'll say this loud for people at the back. <laughs> just because it isn't real doesn't mean it shouldn't be realistic. Like yeah. <laughs> Bret Hart, Brock Lesnar, Steve Austin, you know, the, the, the realism is what creates the ability to do things that are unreal when the time comes at the key moment, right? Like you've got to set the table. You've got to create it. There are rules within storytelling. You know this, you know, Harry Potter it's all made up, <laughs> but if you got to, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to give specific examples, even though I have read all the books, but by the time you're, you're reading the third Harry Potter book, you know that like a certain so-and-so spell beats a so-and-so spell. You know that, you know, you have to have a certain wand, you know, to do that. Whatever. So if in the fourth book, they just sort of go, oh, you know, you, you change those rules. And everyone goes, well, wait a minute, hold on. I thought that so-and-so, and, -so, and mm -hmm. you know, and J.K. Rowling turned around and went, well, it's creative license. I could do whatever I want. You know, everyone would be like, well, I'm not going to get another book then. Does that make any sense? Yeah. None of it makes any sense. None of it's real. But you created rules within your storytelling, right? And you have to do that with wrestling. That's why you have to have rules. Like, <laughs> that's why, you know, when you're in a tag team match, and you tag your partner in, you have five seconds for, you know, where you can both be in the ring. 
So you have five, five, a count of five from the referee to do a double team maneuver. And then the guy who tagged out has got to get out. Yeah. You know? And it's why you got to hold a tag rope and you got to tag hand to hand. You know, uh, like <laughs> be creative by all means. But if you disregard the established sort of rules of engagement, <laughs> you're not it you're not you you're 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 discrediting the audience you're not you're not sort of going oh well it doesn't matter because it's wrestling and i'm just trying to be cool and you know okay boomer like you know move with the times it's like no don't disrespect the audience because yeah. this audience have paid their money to come to to watch a and i i hate i, I cringe even having to say this but you know what the fuck They've come to watch a staged sporting event. Mm -hmm. But a key component of a sporting event is the rules. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the, the, the reason that football fans are, you know, so passionate and fervent in their arguments and everything is because that, that was offside. No, it wasn't offside. Okay, let's go to VAR. I can't believe it. You know, oh, that was a foul. He should have been sent off for that. He shouldn't have been sent off for that. You know, even within football, there are discretionary mm -hmm. calls that a referee can make. Because everybody, it's because everybody has very, very clear understanding of what the rules are. Yeah, you know, and I don't, I'm not sure how we got to that, but, <laughs> but that, no, no, that's a, that's a, that's a, you know, it's an element of wrestling, and 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 the and the, I know we were talking about the sort of the way it can break down very quickly because of, and I think it's all a symptom of this uh, <clears throat> over involvement of the audience in terms yeah. of sharing, you know. Yeah. And like you said, I wish, you know, it's just because you've chosen not to uh, follow as much of the rumor and innuendo and gossip and stuff that's going around about what may or may not be happening behind the scenes. It doesn't mean that you're any less of a fan than someone who consumes yeah. every single bit of it and lives and dies by it. No, I, I honestly think it's enhanced my enjoyment in the last three years. That's exactly what I was about I, to say. I, I, I bet it's, it's enhanced. It's taken me back to a time. And don't get me wrong. I am fascinated by the business and I could, I could speak to you all day about it. But the reality is I still want it as an escapist, purist product. Um, you know, it's been a challenge in the last four years. And actually, wrestling brings joy. And, you know, drama and escapism. Joy. And it, yeah. If, well, if I spend let's, all let's... of my time dealing with contracts and who's right. been fired and who's um, screwing who backstage, it, it lessens my enjoyment of a product that I love. Let, let's let's qualify that statement just by adding one word: good wrestling brings joy. Good wrestling brings joy. Good good pro wrestling yeah. brings joy. Yeah. <clears throat> so look, um, I want to go back pre wrestling gladiators. Yes. Um, that's that quite a topical subject of, at the moment, isn't it? It is, it is. And it's, you know, <clears throat> that was the start of your kind of long and winding road to become a pro wrestler. I mean, you you played this villainous character of Oblivion and um, it looked like you had a lot of fun in that role at the time. How how was the experience for you? It's, to this day, it was one of the best gigs I ever had. I, I have to make one correction. I mean, I was a full-time wrestler when I got the Gladiators. Gig. Right. Like, I... I um. I broke in with the Knight family at 17. And by the time I was 18, I was working for Brian Dixon, you know, so, and, you know, back then his, you know, he had, he was running so many shows. I mean, he was the dominant promoter in England and Europe, you know, so I was, I was, uh, I was, I was not short of shows. I mean, I could, most of the time working for Brian, I think my first year, I could pretty much, I could wrestle about six days a week for most of the year. Um, I was wrestling a lot on Butlins, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and then sort of, and then obviously his, his hall shows, and then I would do some other independence and stuff like that. But <clears throat> I, I sort of, I jumped on the train with All-Star Wrestling and I just, I just sort of stuck with that because it, I mean, I didn't have to keep hustling for bookings and, you know, trying to reach out for people to get booked. I could just wrestle all the time. Um, you know, it didn't make me an internet darling, I suppose, but it was, but for me, it was just, I just loved the, you know, and Brian ran a tight ship. Like he, there were always people in the seats, you know, and 
there was always a certain quality of the venues and the dressing rooms and the music and the lights and everything. It was, you know, you felt like you felt like you were doing something positive. You felt like, you know, you were, you were being a positive contributor to the industry. So when I went to the audition for gladiators, it was, I'd gotten this um, small little acting gig. Uh, one of the, the UK pit bulls, and you probably, you probably remember those guys. Mm -hmm. um, they were attacked. They were from Norfolk too. They're from um, Sheringham. And so I, I would ride up and down the road with them, di you know, different places. Cause obviously a lot of the time you would share your travel with whoever was local. Right. So like there would be, you know, there would be times where we would both be booked somewhere. So we would travel together or whatever. So um, uh, Dave, I think they both were, but Dave sent me this, forwarded me this casting brief um, because he was with a couple of different acting agencies for like heavies, you know, and all that kind of stuff, right? Like the sort of for, you know, they would get the occasional role in like, you know, on a TV show or something like Bouncer or whatever. Um, and he sent me this one because he said, oh, I'm too fat. You know, he's like joking because he's because they said it cut it. The, the, the role called specifically for uh, a, a, it literally said um, tall, muscular in brackets, not fat, <laughs> uh, you know, um, role would suit a pro wrestler because you need to be able to go off the cuff and and vamp with the audience and stuff. And it was basically there was this live motorbike show at the nec in birmingham they had like bike like this big bike festival and they had this live show that was like a it was called the thunderdome games and it was like a sort of 20 30 minute like you know mad max sort of thing where they had these you know stunt riders that would do all these crazy stunts and ride in the thunderdome and all that and they and i basically played this character called the judge who was dressed in this you know post-apocalyptic homoerotic garb yep. and we sort of go like ah oh, who's going to win is it going to be the scorpion or is it going to be the so and so you know whatever you know and uh <laughs> it was like i think i think i think the pay was two thousand pounds for the week which for a wrestler making 40 quid a night was like oh yeah <laughs> and a hotel <laughs> like, wow you know and like so I, and I, I so i submitted to it got it and uh Carl, who wrote and directed that show, happened to have an agency. And he sort of said to me after I was done, hey, look, I have an agency. Um, I mostly deal with stunt performers, but every now and then something comes in for someone like you. Do you want me to keep you on the books? I said, sure. And then a few months later, he called me up and said, can you swim? I said, yeah, are you afraid of heights? Nope. And he said, well, good, because they're bringing gladiators back and you've got an audition. And <laughs> I went to that audition with no expectation. I mean, I was 21. You know, I, I was standing around looking at guys who I recognized from movies and TV shows and magazines and stuff thinking, oh, God, I've got no chance here. Like, he's, you know, he's going to blow me out of the water. But I did quite. I mean, that's the good thing, about, again, about wrestling. You know, people people turn their nose up at wrestling from on an athletic point of view. But my cardio was through the roof back then mm -hmm. because I was wrestling every day. So the first thing they had us do was like these assault courses and stuff because they had it at the um Woolwich Army Barracks, I think, is where they did the auditions. And so they put us on a pretty much a, a army assault course. Yep. Um, and, you know, a lot of these guys had nice looking bodies, but they weren't particularly functional. And suddenly they were dropping like flies, you know, puking and everything else. And me and the other wrestlers who came, we zipped through it pretty quick. So we made it through the first wave of cuts. So then it went from like, because they had 50 people for the auditions and there were six spots. So, and then we do the, you know, and like I said, we all went with no expectations, which is the, be which is the best way to go to an audition. Um, but we made it through that first wave of cuts and it's like, they cut half the guys right off, like right after that first thing. So suddenly we're looking around going, well, hold on a minute. Now I've got like a better than a one in five chance, you know? <laughs> Oh, that is actually you know then you start sort of it starts creeping in like maybe i actually do have a chance that no oh, maybe i should like all right i'm gonna fucking yeah, go start, for it you start visualizing yeah. it yeah 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 and then uh then they just out with no warning they they said all right everyone line up and they made a little makeshift tunnel that would be like an entrance way they started playing music and they said okay make an entrance 
and you saw all these guys who have been all you know fucking bat- you know bravado and giving it the big one and flirting with the producers and you know you know showing off and everything suddenly they they look like scared little boys in pe class like oh i don't want to go you know like you you go first you go first well about 10 guys go in front of me i think and they all literally do the same thing they all walk out and go just scream you know to flex right and i'm just sort of looking around thinking you know and i just saw a bottle of water on the floor and i grabbed it and right as i came through i just poured some on my head put some in my mouth and spat it out like dx style you know and just kind of did something i did you know something i would do as a as a wrestler yeah because obviously i was like well i do this every day you know came out did that and i saw right away i saw a couple of the producers kind of change right away kind of go you know start writing stuff down like oh, okay and then right away they were like you come here and then they put a camera in my face and go talk you know so i just reel off like a again pro wrestling 101 you know go to sort of pro, i was just that pro wrestling got me that gig because i had been wrestling on butlins every day and any given time you'd be getting ready to go out and brian would say yeah get the microphone and talk a little bit gm up you know like you wouldn't have it wasn't there was no format there's no you know script there was no sort of like oh you're cutting a promo today or not sometimes you would just feel like you needed to and and so again you have these sort of go-to promos so i just kind of went like because that was a great thing about the holiday camps was that it was a different audience every time so you could basically do the same act you know so i you know and i come out and go well when i come out here and i look at the teeth on this guy and the hair on this one oh i think it's a woman maybe it's not oh you know real cheap heat stuff right you know the most yeah. ch- crappy cheap heat r- stuff that wrestling fans would go yeah no, this is lame but these TV producers were going, oh my God, you know, how did you think of that? Like, <laughs> brilliant. And of course, I'm going, I don't know, it just, just came to me, I suppose, you know, like, no, I do this all the time at Butlins. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I went back and I had a good feeling about it. And um, it's funny because I, I think I've talked about this before, but I got the call and it was a bit of sweet because I originally was only going to be a reserve on the show okay like they were going to cast six guys and six girls and then they would cast one additional or two additional male and female but they would just be reserved in case one of the guys got hurt so you still got a character and a look and everything but you weren't going to be on the show like you know they sort of say you'll probably be a shoe in for the next season but you're just going to basically train and do all the stuff get paid about 10 percent of what the other guys were getting paid and you know but you won't actually be on the show so i was kind of like well you know it's better than a kick in the nuts okay cool uh i went down and i went to the hotel and i, re- I remember who it was but one of the producers calls me and says can you come and can you come and meet us uh and bring you know bring your stuff like come and meet us at, at, you know outside in 30 minutes we're gonna go to so and so okay the dead of night like we go to this studio and me and me and this other guy demar we go and shoot promo pictures and green screen stuff and all that and i was thinking why are we doing this by ourselves you know Hmm. well basically two of the guys originally cast in the first six failed their drugs test okay so then they basically told us uh two guys failed their drugs tests they're out you're in your name is now oblivion and welcome to the show you're on the cast like that's why you're doing all this stuff now <laughs> you know so it's because we're playing catch up basically so uh, yeah the, the whole sort of bittersweet thing of being a reserve lasted for like a day and then i was like cool so i'm on the team i guess and then um yeah it was but you know as an experience and i think maybe maybe that maybe that's why i chose to really squeeze everything out of it that i could because i didn't think i was going to get it at first but i just remember going to that show thinking not thinking like well gladiators is going to be my career you know (laughs) i just remember thinking this is going to be such a great platform for me to 
develop a profile, you know, for people to know who I am. And so I went on that show and I begged them to let me talk. The first couple episodes, they wouldn't let me talk. They kept giving the microphone to other guys and God bless them. They just weren't good on the mic, but it was like, they were trying to, a bit like in wrestling, when there are certain guys, they're really trying to be successful. You know, they really want to get over and be successful uh, until eventually I do an event and uh, David McIntosh, who was Tornado on that show, he's still a buddy of mine. He loved wrestling. So he thought it was the coolest thing that I was a wrestler. So we would talk wrestling and I would, you know, and, and he had seen the, the promo I'd done in the auditions and stuff. And he said, they've got to let you talk. They've got to let you talk. I said, no, they, they, every time I ask them, they keep telling me that, you know, they, they clearly had, they clearly, for me, they clearly saw me as a sort of less important character, like a background character. Mm -hmm. Like I'd be on the things, but I was always in the multiplayer events and stuff like that, right? Wasn't going to be featured. And we did this one game, uh, Powerball. So it's like three of you. And we go over to the interview set with Ian Wright. And again, the producer says, oh, they're going to interview Tornado. You two just stand there. Okay, fine. Well, Tosh talks a little bit and then he, and then he leads me in and goes, tell him, like, tell him Blivs, you know. So then I'm like, he gave me my opening. And I just reeled off again, just reeled off one of my like pro wrestling 101 promos. Like it was kind of, it was actually a rip off of a Ric Flair promo because I remember Rick, Rick had done this promo and I don't know. I don't think it was, I don't think it was at Crockett. I can't remember. I, it may have been, I don't know where it was actually, but it wasn't Crockett. Cause I remember it wasn't that set, but he did this promo where he said, uh, your credentials could be unlimited but you got to take a long look at yourself before you walk the aisle. And I basically, because it was like the contenders, like some of them were army guys. Some of them were teachers. Some of them were PE teachers. Some of them were this or that. So I was like, I don't care if you're this, I don't care if you're that. Your credentials could be unlimited, but you got to take a long look at yourself before you step up to me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, good promo, yeah, strong finish. <laughs> If you're gonna if you're gonna rip off anyone, rip off the best. Exactly right. We go to we go back to the green room, and all the cast are like, "That was awesome! Oh my god, that was so great!" Like da da da. And uh, one of the producers, Louise, who didn't like me, she was a bitch. She comes in and she's like, "Do you have any idea how much it costs to edit? You know, and take stuff like you weren't supposed to talk, and now you've." you talk for 30 seconds and we're going to have to edit that out of the show. And do you know how much, you know, blah, 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 blah. She's just, you know, just like, just chewing me out. And then the head of the network, the head of sky one, Richard Wolf comes barging in behind her and everyone sort of goes, Oh shit. And I'm and I, honestly, for a second, I thought, Oh, this is it. I'm going to be fired. Like I'm going to be kicked off the show. And he stood there and he pointed at me and goes, you, that's what I want every show. Like I want that. And then he looks at the producers and goes, why hasn't he been doing that on every show? And just throws his hands up and walks out of the room. <laughs> and he's like, and finally, it, someone gets what we're, like, he goes, finally, someone gets what we're trying to do here. That's what I need. I need that every show. And then, of course, the producers are like, oh, 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 good, good job. You know, good, good, job. good work, Nick. You well, know, well, that's, so. that's what, that's what made Gladiator such an institution in 92. You know, it was, it, it dovetailed perfectly with over the top WWF wrestling. That was, that perfect synergy. It was right. big, larger than life characters, wasn't it? And that's, you know, I'm that's so glad they're bringing it back because, message. yeah, the, the, the thing, thing that makes Gladiator is unique is that you get to do both because it is a real competition. Mm -hmm. it, not, there's none of that is worked, you know, like yeah. that. There's no sort of like, oh, let him win, you know, or anything like that. It's like, so you, you get the best of both because you're presented these larger than life over the top characters and you get this sort of, over the top antics if you have the right guy who knows how to do it but the actual contest or you know even though some of them are you know somewhat silly so you know but yeah they are and it is physically i mean it is hard mm -hmm. like you know they're not easy things to do like i mean i remember i mean my arms i tore my bicep in 2015 in mexico and i'm convinced that the reason that, that my bicep tendon finally tore was was still from from wear and tear that happened doing hang tough from years mm. before because we would sit 
in agony after because you know to practice how to do it you know because again you have to realize that we had like two weeks to train for that show and we're supposed to be experts like we're supposed to be so good at this stuff that this it's almost impossible for the contenders to get to do it well they had the same amount of time to practice for this stuff as we did yeah so we're all learning how to do this stuff at the same time so it's like how tough was the one but always it always looked impossible that was the one it's, with the hoops, wasn't it? We had to pull them down. It's really it hard. Yeah. Like, mm. I got pretty good at it towards the end, but it's really hard. Like, because it's not as simple as just holding onto a hoop and swinging out. Like, when it turns and rotates, it's like you'll just drop off. So you had to start with your hand sort of over the top of the hoop so that then when you swung out, by the time it rotated around, you didn't just fall off and drop. Mm. Like, you know, and it's all sort of timing and... You know, and you've got to you've got to have a game plan for where you're going. Have a yeah, yeah, start yeah. And, yeah. Oh, I remember it's, it's, oh. Sam, one of the guys on the show, Atlas. <laughs> he would sit there and he had like a little. He would have a little pad and he would draw. He drew like a little plan, like he had all the rings, and he would go like, if I go from A one to B three, you know, and then I'll go B three to yeah. C four. <laughs> like, what are you doing? You know. But yeah, it was hard. But I we would we, I remember we would all sit there in the in the um therapy room with with uh ultrasound machines like on our elbows because we all had tendonitis, all of us, like from you know, because you just can't swing and stretch, you know, for on on rings like that for hours a day, but we had to because we had to get good at it fast. But you know. It's all your journey, and and as you say, you know, um, you know, it gave you that platform. It gave you this this over the top character, um, and that over the top character would ultimately, and you'll have to tell me if the timings don't quite line up here, but you'll we'll see you become signed to TNA in two thousand eight, and suddenly there you are debuting as the modern day gladiator Brutus Magnus. That's a name. Yeah, um, yeah I know. H- how? How did you feel? Um, because you've described how you felt, you know, with gladiators and, and kind of clawing your way up at, to a degree there by circumstance. I mean, how did you feel when you first got the call up to essentially your your dream of your 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 working for a, a huge US promotion? And also, what was it like moving stateside and making that journey for the first time? Were you ready for it? Well. It was, again, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to, I just had this sort of young naivety. So I just, and I think sometimes that can work in your favor because you can, because you don't put a, a lot of limiting beliefs on yourself. But I was, I was always looking for, like, even when I was doing gladiators I, and I was, you know, there was a short period of time there where I got a small taste of sort of legitimate celebrity in, in Britain, you know, where I was doing the mainstream shows and I was covered in all the mainstream newspapers and, you know, you get, get paparazzi when I'd go to a nightclub and, you know, that sort of thing. And it was sort of surreal. Um, but, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, but for me, you know, I was still sort of thinking like, I hope that this improves my standing in pro wrestling. You know, I wanted people to take me seriously in wrestling. And I was, so I was, um, you know, all, I wasn't allowed to wrestle when I was doing the show, you know, obviously for obvious reasons, they don't want you to get hurt. And so, um, but I was always trying to sort of maintain, you know, a presence in the, in the, in the business. So one of the, one of the things I did was uh, I reached out to, um, FSM magazine, Fighting Spirit magazine, which was at the time was the number one independent uh, pro wrestling magazine in the country. And they were in WH Smith and, you know, most major news agents who had good coverage. Mm -hmm. And James, who was the editor, was a great guy. He, um, he, he wanted to do an interview with me. Uh, And just with just because of everything I had going on at the time, like appearances and media and stuff like that. We, had, we were having a hard time nailing down a time where I could do it. And in the end, I said, do you mind emailing me the questions? And I can write you the answers. I said that way, so I could give you an idea of my writing ability as well. And maybe, you know, maybe you would consider giving me a column. 
And he was like, right away was like, you know, it's so funny. I was thinking about asking you if you were interested in doing that. And so that's how that happened. I, I did the feature and then I started doing the column right after. Um, but so I'll condense it. They do this, they do this feature on me quite, it's a good feature. And they talk about how the, you know, basically com completely covering the fact that being a wrestler was what got me this gig. And now doing stuff that a wrestler does is what made me the standout guy on the show. Cause I, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but you know, I was the, I was like the standout character on the show. Yeah. No, like I was the one. Yeah. I was the one getting most of the sort of booking requests and doing all the media and, you know, stuff like that. Um, I even ran a, an advert with just me on for a while. Like I had my own, like just to advertise the show, they just did like a 30 second thing of me doing all my, craziest stuff um when that feature came out it was in the uh it was the, the the cover story was on aj styles and it was the first time that fsm had done uh, had, had a non-wwe guy on the cover okay because every time they would have a wwe guy on the cover mm. you know they gave they gave all the other promotions a lot of coverage but they always had a wwe guy on the cover and that's, and, and that's a really big deal because that takes a, yes. that takes a lot of confidence on their part yes. that they can that there's enough uh, facial awareness and brand awareness yes. for someone like AJ Styles in right. the mid two thousands to do that. Right, and you know Dixie's background is PR, so she understood you know how significant that was as well. Uh, so she made a big deal of it, you know, and she got a copy of the magazine at the office. And she was sort of showing it to everyone, like, look, you know, this is how good our our presence is getting in the UK. Like they ran a, you know, AJ's on the cover, not it's the first time that they they did someone other than a WWE guy. But then obviously the magazine there is there in the in the in the office. And people thumb through it and she thumbs through it. And you know, they're putting two and two together and they're going, Well, the UK is our strongest market. And this other the other feature article in this magazine is this interview with this british kid who's like having this huge run on this popular tv show <laughs> and he's a wrestler like so it was and then according to kurt angle and i have no reason to not believe kurt i don't know why he would make it up but kurt came over i guess to do media uh and he said he was in, he's in his hotel and he flipped on the TV and he's flipping through the channels and he's and gladiators was on and he saw me on that show. And, and he, and first thing he did was then text Dixie and go, there's this British kid on this show. He's got to be a wrestler. There's no way that this guy isn't a wrestler. Like I just saw him do like the most pro wrestling promo ever. Yeah. And as the story goes, he says, you've got to take a look at this British kid. And she sends him a picture of me goes, is it this guy? he's like yes that's the one she's like yeah i just reached out to him we're gonna sign him so it happened pretty quick because she basically went back to james and said can you put me in touch with this guy so then i was actually i was actually on holiday in um canada i've got family in in bc so i was in vancouver and i got an email from james saying uh, a little out of the blue but dixie carter is trying to get a hold of you do you mind me do you mind if i give her your email i said no not at all you know and I mean, Dixie could not have been more forthcoming. She literally said, uh, <laughs> I'm Dixie Carter. I'm the owner, I'm the owner and president of TNA wrestling. Um, I'd love to know if you'd be interested in coming to America and working for us and signing with that's, TNA. That's a lovely email to receive, isn't it? I just, <laughs> I was just like, I sat there with my then girlfriend and was like, that's it. Like it just, <laughs> it just offered me a contract. It just offered me a job, you know? And it was just like, Incredible. okay, yes. Yeah, I will take it. I mean, look, my first deal was not impressive. It was pay per show, but I, you know, and all that, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, and it moved quickly. So, and that was after season one. So it was like, I did like Terry Taylor then, you know, followed up and, and, you know, went through, they flew me out to Nashville to do those vignettes and, they sort of get, you know, and they, then they start kind of piecing together a timeline of when I, and, and I remember them, they wanted to start me 
in like November or December and I had to say, I, I can't, <laughs> that's when I'm filming the next season of the show. <laughs> so then, and then so just as luck would have it, I ended up starting on the UK tour. Uh, so my first shows for TNA were on the, the UK house shows, you know? Amazing. Um, so it was kind of, it was, I mean, it was good in a way because obviously at least I had some sort of recognition then. So I, I got a, you know, decent reaction, even though people were like, what'd you say his name was? You know, <laughs> like, yeah. that's the guy from Gladiators. Like, wait a minute, you know, but it was, you know, it was a good place to start. And then, yeah. And, and, and honestly, um, I never really looked back. Like I, you know, thinking back on it now, I did the second season of the show. And I guess in my mind, I was just thinking, cause at the time I was just going to fly, I was flying back and forth. I didn't, I didn't relocate to the States right away. That first year. Right. The, well, actually first year and a half I was I would fly in every two weeks because it would tape Monday and Tuesday every other week okay. and then I, and but they would fly me in you know so I was exhausted man I was like I got mm. I mean I, I made diamond with delta within like six months because <laughs> I was just I would you know a lot of the time they would fly me from Norwich too so I'd fly Norwich to Amsterdam Amsterdam to Atlanta Atlanta to Orlando you know, and I would get booked for house shows. So it was like, sometimes I would do that and then I would do house shows, you know, and then from there back to Atlanta, back to Amsterdam, back to Norwich. You know, there were times where I remember this one time, my, my, my ex-girlfriend, you know, she, <laughs> she picked me up once from the, from the airport and I came back and I, and I, I was um, laying on the couch, like watching TV and she thought I died because <laughs> I fell asleep with my eyes open. I was so tired, yeah. like I just drifted off to sleep with like my eyes open and she, she came in and she was like, you know, she thought I died for a second. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's an insane schedule, but it also shows that you were looking at it very pragmatically that you were, you know, you, you're still keeping your options open. You know, that there's an opportunity. I don't even, I, honestly, Ben, that wasn't even really it. That, that, it, 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 I, it wasn't as advanced as that. It was just, um, uh, they, they were just paying me per show and yeah. they didn't seem to mind flying me from England all the time. And that, cause they knew that I had these commitments here. So it wasn't even really a discussion. It wasn't this thing of like, well, we'll do this for now, but then we want you to relocate or whatever. Um, but then after the second season, they, they called us and said, they're not renewing it. They're not going to do another show, another uh, series. So I, you know, I'd done Panto and stuff like that. And I finished up any other sort of commitments I had. And then um, I went, I remember like that's how I sort of parlayed to get my first like guarantee because I basically went back to the office and said, um, uh, you spent like $50,000 on flights for me last year <laughs> and you only paid me like $60,000. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we take this number and this number and put them together and if you agreed to pay me that, I'll relocate to Florida and then you don't have to fly me anymore. Makes sense. And it was kind of, they could, yeah, it was, it was, they couldn't really argue with it. And so it was, and it was, and, but for me, it was, you know, life changing to get a guarantee mm -hmm. like that. I, I was, you know, 23, I think by then, 22, 23. And I was like, I can get an apartment, I can get a car, I can do this, I can do that. Like, you know, I just, it yeah, was, I'll bet. You know, I just sort of just got stuck in. And, um, and we got to know each other um, during the time that you were you were working at Impact. And I think I naturally gravitated towards you because, you know, as, as UK fans, we're, we're pretty starved when it comes to our countrymen being in, in US promotions. We've obviously had a few standouts between Davey Boy Smith and Dynamite Kid and William Regal, but there's not there hasn't until recently has been a huge amount of representation of the Brits in the US. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was I was fascinated to watch your journey and it was you know, well, look back at the now, it's, it was a quicker sense, really, wasn't it? I know, you, you know, the Brutus Magnus very quickly, a Brutus bit got dropped, mercifully. Mm -hmm. um, and before long, you know, you, you were there at a real peak time for Impact. You know, you're mixing yeah. it up with the likes of Kurt Angle, Sting, AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Kevin Nash, yeah. you know, big, big legendary names. And it's only five years in, and you become the first ever British-born world heavyweight champion, defeating defeating Jeff Hardy what what was what was that like was it everything you dreamed it would be yeah, kind of the circumstances was were unfortunate but that wasn't you know but it didn't take away from the from, from the um uh the occasion I guess the um so you know 
I guess, yeah, I guess, you, you know, I did have a relatively quick ascension, but at the same time, I also had during those five years, like TNA underwent like two or three different management changes. So I went through this real cyclical process of like being heavily featured and then not being featured at all. And then being repackaged and then not being featured and then being heavily featured and not being refeatured and repackaged and so on, you know, and every single time somebody new would come in and they'd be like, well, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you came from. I don't know anything about British wrestling. You haven't been in WWE, so I don't know anything about you. Um, and all the while, you know, you're, you know, I was young and I didn't, I didn't get a lot of guidance in terms of like how to conduct myself um, with the sort of politics of wrestling and, you know, seeing things from those people's points of view, like Eric Bischoff or Bruce Pritchard and other guys like that. So I, so I take responsibility for that because I'm, I'm some punk, you know, kid in his mid twenties, who's being confrontational being like, why aren't you putting me on the show more, you know, and then, and being sort of taking umbrage with the idea that they're sort of going, well, I don't know who you are. And I'm going like, well, you should know who I am. Cause I've been on the show, you know, for I've been in this company for like four or five years, you know, so, but that all changed. Uh, I, I think for me, the turning point was when they, they put me in a tag team with Joe. And, and there were, there were I, you know, I say all that, there were people in the, there were always people in that company who, ha, who, who really went to bat for me. Jeff Jarrett, Bob Ryder, um, you know, to name a couple. Obviously Dixie. So even if, even if I wasn't getting a ton of TV time in the US, that would be when they would send me to Mexico to work for AAA or Japan to work for NOAA or stuff like that. So I was getting, I was, you know, I was, I was staying busy, but I um, I got teamed with Joe, Samoa Joe, and that's really the sort of confidence booster for me. That was sort of real, the, the, because that was the first time where I was in an act that I really felt was one of the most popular on the show at that point. Like Joe and I had a period where we were one of the most popular acts. And that was all down to Joe. And that's what then gave me the confidence to relax and give me and to carry myself in a way that, that, that uh, endears yourself to the audience. Cause it's all, you know, so much of what you do is about your nonverbal communication. You've got to carry yourself in a way like you can't be unrealistic, but you've also got to present yourself in a way that, that, you know, tells people like, no, yeah, like, you know, you're, you, you need to pay attention to me, you know, you've yeah. got to command attention. And having that confidence of being with Joe was like, what gave me that last piece of the puzzle, that ability to sort of, you know, settle into myself a little bit and get comfortable in my own skin. And so and then off the back of that, you could, I could feel the audience shifting and being like, mm -hmm. this kid's put in his, you know, he's put in his time, we hated him at first. He was this, you know, he was way too green. He had the horrible gimmick. You know, he, he didn't wrestle the way that we liked. He didn't do that style. You know, he was fumbling a lot of spots. He was, you know, screwing up a lot. But he's put his time in and he's, you know, and I think there was a respect factor that sort of developed with the audience where it was like, you know, he took a licking from us and he's still here, you know. And uh, I felt that in 2013. And, you know, throughout the course of that year that's where i just sort of built momentum and built momentum and built momentum and i could feel and i renegotiated my contract again in that year and i remember my agent at that time this would have been this was like right in the middle of the year so in the summer of that year i'd sort of got a bit of an indication that they were looking at me in that respect like maybe you know he's sort of on the list of names that they might consider for a title run and it, because it ended up being mentioned in the in the negotiations, not as a sort of like, oh, he has to, he, you know, they but yeah. they were using it as a way to go. Hey, we've got big plans for Nick, you know, like you know, because I, I would bog it down with the details, but they were they were trying to sell me on this idea of like very he very very uh, heavily loaded back end contract. You know, where it was right. like, well, well, we'll pay you this much now and this much next year, but then we'll pay you this big, big money. You know, and I was like, no, no, I want. <laughs> yeah. And then I more now, now. More, yeah. 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 Right. And, but that was one of the, they were going, oh, we've got huge plans. You know, you know, Nick's in line for a title run, you know, this and that. So it had been floated around a little bit, but, but now yeah, I remember when I, um, I got, I got there and I mean, I finally found out on the day, you know, I, I 
showed right, up and, okay. and they you know they just kind of said this is it you know you, like it, it, here's what's going to happen you're going to you know you're going to be in this match with jeff and, uh, and, uh, and at what point does that sink in you know this is essentially you know a world heavyweight championship um in a major u.s wrestling company at what point is it is it after you take that belt home and, you, and you're back in the hotel room i mean at what point i think my you... favorite my favorite part of it was <laughs> it sounds soppy but my favorite part was actually calling my mum and telling my mum that was the part that made me the most sort of that that was i think that was the thing that sort of solidified it the most because my parents have always had a very been very supportive of my career but they don't you know they don't know wrestling and they don't really care for it you know and they and they, they 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 are interested in my career but they are not like um you know i i tell them i go oh you know i'm wrestling in sumo hall tomorrow they're kind of like okay you know <laughs> you know but uh you know but they would come to wembley like when we would do wembley and they'd be like it's so cool you know you know wembley that's amazing you know so it was like little things would you know that would sort of solidify like i remember i did this i had this promo i did in wembley with joe actually it was and i you know and i and it was one of the first promos i did that got really really good response i was like said this is england you know whatever right yeah i remember yeah. i was there cheap cheap yeah. pop you know but i remember my dad saying to me afterwards he goes that was really something like he goes you know he, he says one thing to go out and wrestle and you know make people go ooh and ah but it's a whole different thing to have you know ten thousand people just go bonkers but just by saying something you know so that's, that's really something so it's like you know it's funny when you could i always like use their perspective as a way you know as an interesting sort of learning tool because mm. if it impressed them you know then you knew it was was something good right yeah. not to say that they weren't they were very supportive i want to make that point you know that, but in terms of like significance of stuff um so you know called my mom like i always it wasn't like i called her to tell her but i was you know calling like i do i call her every week you know and and uh i remember saying well something interesting happened at work i said i'm now the i'm the world champion and she was just like oh my god you know like the world champion you know and it was like oh yeah like i i get you know because it, it she's obviously followed it enough to know like that's a big deal you know and um and then for me, I think that, you know, the thing that was weird about it was it was a taped show. Mm. So it didn't, you know, so it was like, obviously it leaked and everything like that. But um, what what was really cool for me and, you know, my, my biggest, I try not to think about it too much because it makes me so angry, but I, I wish that they had just waited for four weeks and I could have done it in the UK, which was so bizarre that they never did that, but whatever. Mm-hmm. But what was cool was, I won it right before Christmas and then we took Christmas off. We go, and I went back for Christmas and JB had set up a couple of media things in the, in the UK and they did a fan party. And I remember thinking, who's going to come to a free like fan party just to what, just to talk to me and JB and the place was packed. Like, and you know, and, and people, and they were just, you know, the fans were just, they were, you know, so rabid. It was like this huge celebration um that was the most to me that was sort of the coolest moment was like british fans have like really felt validated by it because no i i I, they finally felt like there was there was a lot of national pride for it you know at the time i'm writing about it and and interviewing you at the time and yeah it's it's a great achievement i i i fully agree with you what you said about wembley i mean i think this is to me that's a classic case of um swerving the audience or doing the thing that isn't the obvious to to make sure that it's a surprise whereas actually you could just occasionally go for the logical route which is do your do a huge uk arena show and have the brit win the world title for the first time yeah and yeah. It, it it might be obvious but actually get that incredible reaction and have yeah. it forevermore um and you, you can only capture that lightning once yeah, so I try. So I, like I said, I try my best not to, yeah. not to uh, harp on it too, too, too often. But I do often think that and go, God, what, what were they thinking? Like, why? Like, the, you really couldn't figure out a way to just stretch this out for another few weeks where I could have won it at Wembley. Like, do you understand yeah. how big that would have been? Like, would, you know. Anyway, but yes, it was 
considering that there were multiple times during my TNA career where I was very close to getting fired. You know, I'm sure of that. I mean, it was one time for sure where I was pretty much told like, you're on the bubble and then you saved, you know, and you turned it around. It was with Bischoff. Like I was on this cut list and then I went and found Bischoff. I didn't know that at the time, but I, I basically went and confronted Eric and said like, tell me what your problem is with me or fire me right now. And he was like, well, 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 what do you mean? And I said, well, you're not doing anything with me and you won't even give me the time of day. So tell me what, tell me what the problem is or fire me. And then he kind of, you know, and then we, we had a talk and he said something about, well, you know, you've said before that you'd be open to going to WWE. I said, look around you. I said the same thing as, the same thing as everyone else in this, on this roster. And I was like, really? That's, yeah, really? That's your, you know, that's, that's your problem. Like that I would consider going to the show, like grow up, you know? And I told him that like straight, I was like, that's, you know, that's stupid. Like I said, I'm loyal to whoever I'm under contract to right now. And I'll give you my, you know, I'll give you my absolute best, like where I'm under contract to now, but <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm actively trying to go there. I'm just saying that I'd be open to it. Of course I would. It's the show, you know, who doesn't want to go there. Um, and he kind of went, well, I suppose you're right. And I said, you've been there. <laughs> you, you, you tried to put him out of business, but you went there. And they kind of went, well, you're right. I guess you're right. You know, so I said, okay, cool. So do we have a problem or do I need to find somewhere else to work? And he's like, no, no, we don't have a problem. And apparently he went into the, he went right into the, the production meeting and said, we need to find more with that kid. Like, you know, he's got balls. So anyway, I say all that to say that, you know, I, the fact that I had various times where I was like, you know, where they had thought so little of me that I was close to being let go. <laughs> Yeah. you know, to then, to then sort of power through and, and earn my, you know, earn my spot and, and work my way up to working with all those top guys and, and, and then, you know, being considered like the right guy to be the world champion. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's validation. And I've done that. I've done that in every promotion I've worked with. Yeah. It's, it's one heck of a journey. And, you know, as you say, climbing the top of the mountain from where you started is incredible, but, um, obviously not only a world title at TNA, but you, um, you met your wife there. So you met Mickey yeah. um, early days of TNA, I believe. Um, and the two of you um, married in 2015. Um, how, well, I guess first, how did you, how did, how did that kind of meeting come about? And secondly, I guess what I'm really curious now is how, how have you successfully managed to kind of navigate married life as two pro wrestlers with the kind of crazy touring schedules that go with the territory of what well, you do? truthfully uh, it hasn't always been easy you know that's the 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 real answer to that it hasn't always been easy we you know things are fantastic with us now and they have been for quite some time and i'm very you know i'm I'm very glad about that you know um but there have been times where it's been tough you know there's there's, there's no way to sugarcoat it it's hard uh so anyway we met uh, she came in i think i think she came in around october or something of 2010 something like that um, and you know, th- th- that was one of the most difficult things to navigate early on was, that, you know, she was so much more of a, more of a star than me, you know, she, she had such a, so much bigger profile than me and she still does, you know, she's a bigger star. Um, you know, and that can be tough because I was very, it wasn't, obviously it's like, no, nobody likes to be standing there while, you know, a bunch of people are asking your wife for autographs and not you you know, and stuff like that. But you, but that, you know, you can deal with that. It's, it's more about, for me, it was, it was tough when I was trying to work my way up to a similar level. And you have to be very careful not to be just known as, oh, that's the guy that's dating Mickey, you know, mm-hmm. um, which can, you know, cause it's one of those things it's that's, that's where there's a, that's where there's a sort of double standard with men and women because if a woman dates a guy who's more famous, you know, it's, I don't think it's as difficult for them to continue to ascend and climb, you know, but God, if I had a, if I had a a pound for every time someone's tried to troll me for, you know, for, for uh, the, the fact that my wife is more well known than I am, you know, or tried to suggest that somehow like, you know, 
my uh, my accomplishments are somehow you know because of her. It's like there's a there's a real double standard you know sort of um, misogyny still that exists there. Like somehow you're less of a man you know and all this kind of. I mean I never bought into any of it. I always thought it was hilarious because you know the guy the kind of guys that say that are the kind of guys that would. Sw- I always you know when I say I've said this to other guys who have been in similar positions who have come to me for advice. I always thought the same thing when I see this kind of stuff. Just remember anyone who says that to you, they would swap lives with you in a heartbeat. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, you know, as long as you sort of maintain that understanding, it's like, all right, cool, man, you do you, you do your thing. But um, no, it was, <clears throat> I was, I've always tried to not have any resentment, you know, and again, it's not always easy because we're both alphas. Like Billy Corgan said that about us, you know, and you talk about Alpha, you know, like there's a guy who's a huge star and obviously, you know, I've worked closely with him now for a few years. And it's like, he he came, he's come and stayed at the house with us a few times. And I remember once he said something um, where he was like, you know, it's fascinating watching you two coexist and operate because you're two alphas. Like, but that's why we make it work because mm. there is no dominant decision maker. There is no dominant, uh, actor you know in, in this in this scenario right it's it's very much like that's your show this is my show that's your thing mm-hmm. this is my thing not in a possessive way but in a like you do you like you know i'm here but i'm here to help in any way yeah, i can I mean, how, how much how much does wrestling and i guess talking shop fit into your we relationship do, we do talk shop we do talk shop you know um Early on in our in our relationship, I think there was a time where we did. She especially was very keen to sort of say, "Okay, like let's no more shop talk now." You know, like let's you know let, let's talk about something other than wrestling. Yeah, you know? you know, and which is, you know, and I'm glad that she did. You know, but um, you don't get to be as good as she is. She's Hall of Fame career, ten time champion. You know a real sort of uh standard bearer for women's wrestling and you know and truth you know you know maybe i'm biased but i really don't think that she gets enough credit for she's really the blueprint for what women's wrestling is now because mm-hmm. she was a beautiful woman who was happy to sort of embrace her sexuality and 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 uh utilize it but it wasn't her defining characteristic mm-hmm. right like when during a period where when she came up, every woman that was their defining characteristic was how attractive they were. Mickey's wasn't, you know, and she was one of the first, she was one of the first girls to do Like, obviously if they had, they had certain characters who were not there to be pinups, but they were always, they were always the heel. You know, they were always like the, the party pooper, like, no, you cut no, you know, put your clothes back on, boo, you know. But Mickey was one well, of the uh... first ones who was presented in a way that was positive. But she was, but it, but her, but her happening to be an attractive woman was a sort of, was an added bonus. It wasn't her mm. defining persona. I always go back to you know the match that she and Trish had at WrestleMania 22. The crowd, I think that was in Chicago. I mean, the crowd for that match was out of this world. It was a real precursor to what we'd <laughs> see years later right. with women's wrestling. Where actually because you, they, you because just, it was the because they had a real storyline story. and it, it had was, a real and story. It, and it had a had about a four right. month build and there were characters right. and it and then. They delivered in the ring and that crowd right. just ate it up and credit and, to um, brian gewertz yeah. you know for for a lot of that because you know he because he, he pioneered a lot of that stuff that that said no women need to be you know booked and and you know written for the same way as the guys like they need you know but it but in a way that enhances their personalities not trying to get them to be like the guys you know like that was a great example of how to do a female centric angle, you know, perfectly because it was this sort of, it was the, 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 the single white female, you know, sort of stalker, like, like slightly obsessed, you know, like, like that wouldn't have played yeah. as well with male characters because, because it yeah. wouldn't, but with women, it was like, it was totally relatable. Mm. And then, you know, and, and it just, and it just set Mickey off on a, you know, I mean, people still talk about it to this day. It's yeah. still, when you, you talk about her career and everything she's done to this day, people are still talking about that angle with Trish and it was her first mm-hmm. angle. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I'd imagine one of the bits which has had a real um, 
kind of impact for both of you has been um you know becoming parents you became parents yeah. to, to your son Donovan in, in 2014 um I remember chatting to you in your very early days of a fatherhood that boy's been a similar age and obviously they're not babies yeah. anymore um how would you describe that journey so far as a parent and what's what surprised you about parenting uh, well I do remember like instantly understanding that life is not going to be the same uh and i i think people say that sometimes and it's it's such a sort of it's such an all-encompassing type of phrase that it's you know it's and sometimes somehow it gets skewed as negative and i don't mean it in a negative way i just mean like immediately mm. immediately your whole value system changes like I had so much more perspective. Like, I remember going to John Gaburik, who had been in charge at TNA, and he was the guy responsible for me being the champion. Like, he'd given me the big push and all that. But we'd also, but then we had also butted heads, and we had become, and, and there, you know, and there, and it had become contentious. And after Donovan was born, I remember going to him because he had said something to me about it's going to change your life. Like, when you've got a kid, it's all going to, you know. And, and I kind of did the whole kind of yeah 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 sure 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 and I remember going to him and saying you're right like it, the stuff that used to bother me I don't have any time for anymore like somebody said something about you on something and who cares I don't I don't have the energy you know like I've got a baby like and we're taking care of a baby like or even before he was born like I've got a heavily pregnant wife and you know I've got to take, I've got to run the whole, I've got to run the house. I've got to take care of the dogs. I've got to get everything ready for this, you know, when this baby comes, you know, like you can be too, you can get too close to the business sometimes, you know, you can get too involved, like where you, you know, again, it's like I said, like I, that's why I tell guys now, you can love the business, but it won't always love you back. And the more you try to love it, you know, the less it will love you back, right? Like you have to, you have to maintain a healthy, distance and uh you know mickey had a long labor like she you know just, he, he, he took a long time to come out and then they finally said we can't wait any longer we're you know he, he's coming out <laughs> so but i you know uh i mean we were 24 hours you know her labor officially was like i think it was 28 something like that officially but it was like by the time we go to the hospital and we get in there you know it's like i by the time that day was over I, you know, I, I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell you anything that was bothering me about the wrestling business, you know, do you know what I mean? It's like, and so I, when I say I instantly had this, just so much healthier perspective on everything, like, um, and I think that comes, you know, like parenting is hard, you know, it's, it's like, there's no, there's no, there's no manual. There's no course you can take. There's no, <laughs> Um, and sometimes you can seemingly do everything right. And somehow it still doesn't seem to work out. And then sometimes you can feel like you're doing a, you're being a bad parent. You sometimes, I mean, there are times where I think, God, am I doing a bad job? Like, am I, you know, and then I, I always, but, I was having this conversation with someone the other day. I always think if you're asking the question, am I a bad parent? You're probably a good parent. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like just the fact that we, you know, Mickey and I have those conversations, I said, probably indicates that we're somewhere somehow somewhere along the lines of the, being the, on the nightly right the nightly debrief where you you kind of <laughs> yeah. sort of things you wish you'd done better well like and can you believe you can you believe he said that to us like yeah where did he get that from that's the best one it's like like you know yesterday donovan went to bed and and he's declared to us i'm putting myself to bed i don't need you and of course mickey was like whoa heartbroken you know oh. like why did he say that and I was like, because he's just experimenting with his boundaries, boundaries and his mm. decision making. You know, he's just he's he's experimenting with his independence. Like he, you know, I said, look at look at his look at look at his DNA. He's got two pretty independent thinkers here. Like you don't think at some point he's gonna say I'm gonna make my own decisions. Like this morning he said I'm I'm gonna choose what I'm gonna wear. 
I don't need your help. I said, cool, go ahead. You know, like, but yeah, you have those moments where you go, well, where did that come from? Like, what's the deal there? But um, I, God, I, I love being a parent. I mean, I just, you know, I can't get enough of him. Like, and it, it, again, I think that's, that's a good thing. And, and certainly, and again, without, without trying to be too corny, you, you know, it's like, if ever I'm finding myself in a challenging moment, you know, or I need to sort of reset and recalibrate mentally or sort of, you know, find some motivation or, you know, feel like I'm procrastinating on stuff and, you know, feeling resistance, you know, the, one of the surefire ways to bust through it is, is to just remind yourself like, well, don't do it for you, do it for him. You know, mm -hmm. like he goes to a private school. You want to keep doing that? Well, you know, you know, put your ass to work. Like, you know, you want him to have nice things. You want, you know, you, you like this house. <laughs> you want him to, you know, you want him to be set up. You want him to have all, you know, more opportunities than you had you know, stop fucking complaining and fucking do something. You know, you've, you made it this far, fucking figure it out. Like I have those conversations with myself sometimes, you know, where mm -hmm. it's like, I, you know, I don't want him to be spoiled. He is, <laughs> you know, he's going to be more spoiled than I was like that, you know, and, but, but he's also going to get the 411 on like what it took. You know, that's the way I look like he understands what it takes. That kid has, has already got 25,000 frequent flyer miles. <laughs> you know, he's been, he just came with me last weekend to St. Louis, you know, five hour drive, five hours back, sat in the dressing room, you know, where well, we had a hotel. He was excited about that. And we stayed at a casino. So he's very excited about that. But it's like, you know, there are times where we go, hey, mommy's got a convention this weekend and daddy's got a show in, so and so, you're going to have to come with Daddy, and you can tell he's like, you know, I don't want to go. No, does well, he have any? Sorry. Does it? Does Does he have any interest in wrestling or what you do, or does he just see it as norm because he, that's what he's always known? He does, in, but he just thinks of it as sort of a fun activity. He knows that we do it. Like he'll say to me sometimes, "Dad, you're a very good wrestler," you know, <laughs> and I'll be like, "Well, I'm okay, thanks." But and you know, and he'll say, "Mummy's a very good wrestler," you know. I'll say, "Yeah, you're right about that." Like it. So I think he sort of, but you know, I think he, he's been, you have to, you have to remember this kid's been, he's been backstage at Impact. He was backstage at Wembley Arena when he was a baby. He's been backstage at Monday Night Raw. He's been backstage at NWA Power. Like he's seen a lot of the business already. Mm -hmm. And my take on it is whether or not he ever wants to get into the business is that's up to him. It's not my concern to, you know, it's not, it's not my decision to make and, and I support him either way, but, I, but I am glad that he has, particularly when it came to like NWA power, like he was backstage at the first couple of tapings for NWA power. And that atmosphere in those first two seasons was really special. Like there was a real, uh, there was a real combined sort of team effort and a team sort of, there was an electricity between everybody where everyone was like we're gonna fucking make something of this and for me it's it's important to me that he even if he has no interest in the business later on in life he's gotten to watch people in their element like applying their passion to something and doing something with real feeling and 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 passion and and with a you know with a, a massive amount of dedication to it like he's witnessed professionals doing what they love to do at the highest level at Monday night raw, you know, and stuff like that. Like he's, he's seen his parents completely engaged in what they do in what they're doing. So if nothing else, he will at least understand the difference between a job and a career and, yes. you know, and a profession like, and he'll understand the difference in like, here's how you act when it's just a job and you know, here's how you act when it's your profession and you take pride in what you do. Like he's been around a lot of people who take pride in what they do. Yeah. And I can relate to that because I've conversations with my son since I've set up my own company and he talks that I talk about loving what I do for a living and um, you know, how I got here 
and right. jobs that I didn't enjoy. And right. that you do, you know, and I, and what I hope that will imbue in him is a uh, his own sense of entrepreneurialism to actually go yes. and carve his own path rather than just accept yes. the status quo. Um, I want to talk to you about professionalism. So, um, you obviously moved on. There's obviously a, a, a period of time between, um, you know, impact your ty- your tenure at impact coming to an end and move into, you know, this incredibly historic promotion um in the national wrestling alliance um whereby you you, you essentially became uh, you know you've been pretty much the face of that promotion for the last five years you've carried this you know the 10 pounds of gold that's behind you um you know you carried this world title belt for you know incredibly over a thousand days but but throughout that all um you've really seemed to be someone that was very committed to restoring tradition back to the sport to kind of pushing for this big fight feel. And I I heard an interview where you were saying about how, um, I'll paraphrase you, but you were kind of saying, you know, you're committed to putting on the very best performance you can every single time you go out, you know, regardless of the audience size or or what the show is. Uh, Why is professionalism so important to you? When I, told my parents that I was going to go to wrestling school and I, you know, and this, and I was going to, I was serious. I was going to do it, you know, like, cause I'd heard me talking about it and I said, well, I found the school now I'm going to go. You know, my mother at first was a bit sort of like, Oh, please don't do it. But you know, please don't do that. Like you're going to get hurt. You know, whatever, like, whatever. my dad, I said, well, if you're serious about doing this as a career, he said, do it, but make sure that you commit to it and do it properly. And that was it. It was very short, you know, concise kind of mm. <laughs> edict. <laughs> good but advice. Very good advice. But my dad was not, you know, he was not a sort of big disciplinarian or anything. In fact, if anything, he was quite liberal, you know, so it had more impact because, you know, my father was, had, a, had a very good career you know, and, and he was very well respected in his field, you know, so it was like, he understood what it, he, you know, he said, I love my, I love my job. My, and I, I love my line of work. So he's like, if this is what you love, like this, you, you know, you want this to be your career, but treat it like a career, treat it like a business. And I did. And the thing is an old adage in wrestling and it's, but it's, it's to this day is the most important one. And it's the one that, 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 that so many people miss. And it's just simple. It's, it's if you believe it, they believe it. You cannot get, again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about suspension of disbelief and about, you know, escapism and taking people on a ride. The first step to accomplishing that is having conviction in the way you act and the way you talk and the way you look at somebody, the way you walk into a room. If any of those things aren't there, immediately people's, you know, level of expectation drops, and they are oh, we'll just, just all right. We're going to sit through this guy's match. All right, whatever, you know. You've got to create a feeling. Whether there's fifty people or fifty thousand, you've got to walk out into that room and create a feeling where people go. This I have to pay attention to this guy's different. Like this guy is an alpha, you know, this guy has my attention. Mm. Like, and a lot of that comes and, you know, truthfully, um, I had a period after TNA where I started to feel like I didn't fit in because I was looking at the business. Like, oh, I spent all this time trying to perfect this particular type of performance and style and, 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 you know, act, I guess, for lack of a better term. Right. And at the time, everything was about multiple high spots. I, you know, it still is in a lot of ways, you know, just so acrobatics and, you know, endless amounts of memorized kind of catch this, duck this, spin around over the, over the top, through the legs, you know, something else, kick something, pop right back up, something else, nip up, nip up, 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 up. Oh, it's never going to be me. Um, and, you know, so I went kind of cold. I was, I was cold. I was ice cold. Like, you know, and, and 
And then I started to sort of ask myself, well, what have you really done? Like since TNA, like what reason have you given anyone to give a shit about you? And the truth is nothing. I hadn't done anything to give it, give people a reason to give a shit about me. The business had changed. And one of the thing, big things that had changed was that now, you know, there's an expectation for you to put out content. Like the days of a guy getting into the business and just sending an eight by 10 to a promoter are long gone. Like now yeah. you need to, now the, uh, you know, guys who go to wrestling school now, they should also be learning how to edit videos. They, they should be learning graphic design, you know, and like, because pretty soon it's going to be an expectation of any talent at any level to have a 30, 60, 90 second highlight reel of their best shit that, you know, that's there ready, accessible, pinned on their Twitter or whatever it is like that people can see, you know, uh, until you reach a certain level of credibility. Like, and so then when the NWA came along and I was sort of, I'll give you the cliff notes, but it was like, Billy buys the, buys the intellectual property. There was no company. He just bought the intellectual property, said, all right, I'm going to figure out something to do with this. Calls me and says, I desperately want to see more wrestling. That's like the wrestling that I grew up with more. Like I see many, so I see so much wrestling now that's two guys cooperating with each other and doing a lot of acrobatics. I desperately want to see more uh, believable, athletic, rugged wrestling. So right away, that sort of piqued my interest. And he said, you know, I want to put more emphasis on size, which uh, I appreciated, but I didn't think was, that's, that's not necessarily, that's not a fundamental requirement. It's, it's important to have a variety of size, but it is important to have some guys with size, I will say. And obviously, if you've got two guys that can do the same amount of stuff, you should go with the bigger one. You know, it's mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's a visual, it's a visual medium, uh, you know, but um, I said, all right, cool. And I just, and my input was, this was August or September of 2017. And I said, I just bought two boxing pay-per-views back to back in the span of 30 days. I bought Mayweather and McGregor and I bought Canelo and Triple G, mm -hmm. both for completely different reasons. But I bought one because it was two alpha males, you know, larger than life, Ric Flair style and profiling, you know, I'm rich, I'm rich too. Oh, fuck you. You know, you, you know what I mean? Like I've got a private jet, I've got two private jets, you know, whatever it was. Right. But then, and, and it, but it was all about the, the personalities. And yeah. then I bought Canelo and triple G because it was finally this guy, triple G, he's my favorite boxer. This guy has been grafting for years. He's been kicking ass in Europe. Nobody would, nobody would promote him in America. He finally comes to America, murders everybody. And even though he's already in his thirties, he's now going like, no, I'm the best middleweight. Like, and it was the two, and it was like, for once in boxing, we're going to get the two best guys in the, in their division are going to face each other. Like, and here's why they're the two best guys. And so, you know, you two different fights that I bought for two different reasons but they were both enhanced by these incredible video packages. You know, that by the time you get to the end of them, you're like, I have to see this fight. I have to see these two collide. And I said, why is wrestling not doing this anymore? Like, when did it just become about, when did it just become, well, these two are gonna have a good match with each other? No, 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 mm. that's not what you're supposed to think. You're supposed to think I've become so invested in these two personalities and however they interact with one another, whether it's positive, negative, you know, whatever, that I absolutely must see the conclusion of this now. I absolutely must see the collision between this you know, person also, number one and person also number two. The, the pacing of it, I mean, we, we referenced it with, you know, with Mickey's feud with Trish, but also, I mean, you and I grew up on early 90s wrestling where there were four supercards a year. And you were waiting eight to twelve weeks per payoff per feud if you right. even got a payoff. Um, versus people, people forget booked. that 
people forget that like you're supposed to be able to relate somewhere to what's going on i mean unless you're a, unless you're a psychopath like have you ever had a, 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 a an interaction with someone you know one interaction and then within within the space of an hour or, or a couple of days like you <laughs> hate that person and you want to you know and you want to kill no yeah. like if you've ever developed a you know real like dislike or even hatred for someone the chances are it's, it's developed over time you know you don't hate people yeah. that you just met like so it's it's asinine to to, to try to create a, a situation where wrestler a interacts with wrestler b and then the following week, they're like, you know, beating the hell out of each other. You know, it's like, it's just, it's, you know, it's That's all rooted psychology, in psychology, isn't it? Human psychology, right. It's just human psychology. It's, it, it's you, to understand how to do pro wrestling is to understand how people think on a fundamental human level, I think. Like what makes people jealous? What makes people angry? What do people want to see? Like, Scott Hall told me this great thing once where it's like uh, about fear and greed. So like when the baby face is selling, when the, when the good guy is, is losing, is, is getting beat up and he's selling, you as the audience, you feel fear because you're going, no, I, you know, I, this is the guy I want to win. I don't want him to lose because then I lose too, right? Mm -hmm. And then when the baby face finds an opening and starts making his comeback, now you feel greed because like more, 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 you know, like, because now, because again, you're living vicariously the person. So, you know, oh, I want to, he's going to win. That means I get to win, you know? And again, all of those things require patience and they require commitment. Uh, and so for me, you know, going back to your question, um, I made the decision like, well, the starting point here is what 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 do I have working in my favor? Uh, that I've got some credibility with what I've done in the past. Uh, I speak quite well, and when the time comes that I have this belt, you know, this NWA ten pounds of gold. That's the that's the asset. Like that's I, I now I have the credibility of all the men that held it before me to build off of. So now I have to do everything I can not to say, not to compare myself to those people, not to suggest that I should be considered in the same vein as those people, but I'm going to do everything I can to at least make you forget during the time I come out and in the time I'm in the ring, I'm going to at least make you feel like there's at least some shred of a comparison that could be made, you know, like, I'm going to make, I'm going to try to make you forget that we're in a, 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 a you know, a VFW hall in front of 200 people. Like I'm going to present myself in such a way and have the belt presented in such a way and, and carry myself in such a way that you feel like this is the most important thing happening right now in my life. You know, mm. I need to see the outcome, the conclusion of this match because that belt is important. And that means that guy holding it is important. And it sounds yeah. simplistic, but it's, but it's true. No, and, and, and you've done that. I mean, it's very easy to overlook the prestige and, and lineage of, of, of that belt there. Um, you know, for any of our, any of our listeners who, who haven't got a, a long knowledge or, or understanding of wrestling, I mean, the NWA title you know, was the title. It's, right. it, it predate, predates the WWF, WWE right. championship. It, and, it officially uh, started in 1948. And, and and in some cases can even date back to as far as 1905. Incredible. And I think, you know, it, it famously had the, um, the bout at, uh, at All In um, against Cody Rhodes, where that title was on the line. And I think the, right. the pageantry and the, you know, the visual of that belt um, going into that match being held aloft by Cody at the end of the match, like his father had before him, um, you know, incredible and not lost on a generation of wrestling fans. Well, like you, like you said earlier about the whole Wembley thing, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to capitalize on all the right things in that moment. So when that one came along, we all said, that's the piece of business that needs to be done. 
Like that's a moment that will only come along once and we have to do it. And that's my, it's my best achievement in my career uh, solely because of where things had been for me less than a year prior. Right. Like a year before that, nobody was talking about me and nobody was talking about the NWA title to, to, if you'd have told anybody, one of the most talked about matches in the, in the entire industry is going to be between Nick Aldis and Cody Rhodes. Like this time next year, people would have been like, what? Like, and Cody I don't see how that's going to happen. He'd have said the same at the time, right? Hmm? Cody would have said the same at the time. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And it was a testament to both of us. Like, we, you know, I manifested a lot of that into existence, and so did he. And, um, you know, it, for me, that it, it's the most validating sort of moment of my career was when the bell rings at the beginning of that match, when there's 11,000 people, you know, that that building sold out in 30 minutes. And... Uh, you know, to have them all just at a fever pitch where they were frenzied, you know, before we'd even touched. Um, that's, again, that's a rare thing that happens, you know, very, very rarely in our business. And, and, and I was fortunate enough to get a chance to experience it. And I think we both, you know, Cody and I, I think we'll forever have this sort of respect for each other because of it, because we both understood that we did this. There was no, there was no brain trust. There was no you know, writers, there was no booker, there was no sort of almighty, powerful person saying, this is going to be the match, it's going to be you. We did it between us. Like, we set it up and executed it. Every single bit of it, like, was a collaborative effort between the two guys, you know, and other people who were involved, Dave Lagana and Billy and Ring of Honor and different guys, but at the core of it, like the execution of that whole piece of business was between Cody and I. And again, it goes back to what I was saying about uh, putting your ego to the side because we're in a business. Like there was never, there was not a single discussion ever about what, who was going to win. Yeah. Because there was no need. There was no, it, there was no sort of like, well, hey, listen, I don't you know. I think we should, you know, no, no, no. We know like, there's a once in a lifetime opportunity here. Like, and tonight I'm Apollo Creed and tonight you're Rocky. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not that hard. Would you, um, would you put that up as your, your best match or your, well, my best moment? Hard to pinpoint, but your best moment for, for atmosphere and energy and atmosphere. Yeah. For atmosphere and stuff. Yeah. hundred percent. Like, yeah. But, you know, for sure. Um, I actually thought that our return match that we had six weeks later in Nashville, which was another sellout, um, was a much better match as much because it was two yeah, out of three great. falls and we could, you know, we had way more time and we really like, we had, to, had a lot of fun with that. And we, you know, we debuted Camille in that match and she's, you know, now she's had a great run since then. And it's like, it, it feels, you know, it gives me a lot of pride to see that, you know, again, something that I was sort of involved with at the beginning is, you know, she's now gone on to have her own great career and she's making a good living from wrestling now and stuff like that. But, um, you know, and I've had other other matches where I've been like, that's that's my best work. But uh, in terms of that's all in my best piece of business, you know. So when you consider when not when when you consider what I can what I believe wrestling to be, yes, it's my best match because half of the work was done before the bell which is when it's really done right, that's what the wrestling business is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be, oh my God, this wrestler's really good and this wrestler's really good and they're going to wrestle each other. Oh my God, it's going to be such an epic match. Well, you've missed out on the whole, you've missed out on half the recipe, which is building the anticipation for the match. If the anticipation for the match is just going to be, oh my God, it's going to be a great match. It's going to be a five-star match. This is awesome. This is awesome. You know, so like, how many times can you do that? Like, you know, but if you can do all that after you've already created a situation where half the work has already been done. So by the time the bell rings, people are like, I really can't wait to see this now. Not just for the fact that it's, that we think it's going to be a good match. Like 
but because we're so invested in 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 the outcome like that's when wrestling's done absolutely right and that's why that's what wwe is better at than anyone else and it's why they've always been number one so you, you've um you, you've kind of talked about um we've talked about wwe a few times you've talked about the different promotions um that you've been in or you've aspired to you've clearly still got a lot left in the tank and you're a long way from hanging up the boots but um how do you feel about what you've accomplished so far and i guess what do you hope that Nick Aldis's wrestling legacy will be when it's all said and done. I've I feel good about what I've accomplished, you know, uh, as much as I've taken the opportunities that I had and, and ran with them, you know. Um, ultimately, what I'm hoping for is that I get the ultimate opportunity you know, truthfully, like it's the one that's eluded me my whole career because people, you can have whatever opinion of me you want. I don't care, but I don't think anyone can say that I haven't, especially now with what I've done with the NWA, I don't think anyone could with a straight face say that I don't make the most out of every opportunity that I get. And you know, when you talk about all in with me and Cody, <laughs> that's what we were able to accomplish with he and I and a handful of people and a YouTube show. <laughs> Is there any way I could get a chance to have a fucking go with a multi-million dollar, <laughs> with a multi-billion dollar marketing team behind me? You know what I mean? Is, it, is there any chance, like, you know, could I get one shot at maybe trying it with, with a whole crew of people who are much better at this than me. Cause I'll tell you, I've managed to achieve some pretty decent stuff. And a lot of the time I haven't had a whole lot of help. Like sometimes I have, and I'm not trying to discredit anyone who's been involved, you know, with any of the stuff that I've done, but there have been times where I've been able to, I've made something out of nothing. Is there, is, is there any way that, that someone could think that maybe I've done enough to at least get an opportunity? You know, I, I'm not asking to start center forward, <laughs> you know. I'm happy to, I'll, ha I'll, I'll happily start on the bench if that's what I have to do. But is there any way I could at least get a shot? You know, that would be, for me, would be the sort of, it's, you know, that's the one thing that's eluded me is, is the opportunity, the ultimate opportunity. Uh, sure. Having said that, uh i think that historically you know I, that's the thing i'm probably most proud of with my nwa stuff is that i've been able to rekindle the prestige of that championship so now there's a bit more of a so now there's a there's a there's a a period now in modern history with the nwa title that people can look at with not the same level of credibility, but with a certain amount of pride in comparison to Harley Race and Dory Funk and Jack Briscoe and Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes, where they can go, you know, obviously it wasn't the same, but this run was a hell of a run, you know? And like, man, he defended it all over the world. He was the first guy to defend it in China. He defended it in Australia. He defended it in Puerto Rico. He defended it in Canada. You know, he defended it in, in, the, in the UK. He defended it all over the United States. And then, you know, takes it from nothing to, to you know, to one of, the, one of the most pivotal and historically important shows in the modern era, you know, in Chicago, that is arguably the launching point for the, now the new number two promotion which is now make a lot of people millionaires. It's like, there's a pride to be taken in all of that because I didn't draw the house at all in, but I do think that if you take, if you, if you look at that show and you, and it doesn't have me and Cody, it's a very different show. Agreed. Well, you've had a, you've had a heck of a run. 
had a heck of a career, had a heck of a life, to be honest. It, you know, it's been fascinating talking to you today. The, the last thing that I want to ask you about, and thank you so much for your time and your, your honesty and your openness today, Nick. Um, going back to your business, going back to Legacy Sports Nutrition, um, I know how, po- how important personal wellness is, and it feels like we're going for a we're going for a challenging time at the moment, I think, post-pandemic for a lot of people with their health and their well-being. And I know you spend a lot of time giving customers advice personally through the business. Um, mm. Can you share a, a couple of tips with our listeners um, that they can take away to either you know, simple simple hacks and simple tips? Mm. And I saw you talking recently about kind of dopamine and scripts, like screens, like a couple of things that they can oh, do yeah. to improve their health yeah, and well-being. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a that's a really that's a big one. Uh, try to try to give yourself a two or three periods every day, where if you find yourself just aimlessly scrolling through your phone, I do it. Everyone does it. Like you know, I, I always I always feel reluctant about posting stuff like that because I don't want it to seem like preachy. Like I'm perfect. I'm doing because I do it too. Mm. But to have the awareness to go, what are you even doing? Like you're just sitting here. You're not like you're procrastinating on the things that need to get done, but you're scrolling through your phone and checking emails or checking Instagram or whatever, so that you feel like you're doing something productive, but you're not. You're you're doing something. You're, you're it's a dopamine addiction. You're it's 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 the feeling of doing something productive so that you then feel you know relieved. You've got this because it's because your brain wants dopamine. Just put it away. And like go outside, meditate, go sit, you know, go play with your kids, go do just something, anything other than be sort of, um, um, you know, a slave to your device for a minute. And just try to do that two or three times a day, you know, where you'll immediately feel better because you'll go, oh, I didn't miss anything, (laughs) you know, Uh, like. The, the world's craziest thing didn't happen in the 10 minutes that I was just, you know, watering the plants or whatever it was I was doing. And I feel much better. And, you know, I reconnected with the world. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's one major thing. I, our, our other bestseller, I talked about Test X9, but our other bestseller is Recovery PM Sleep Aid. And I'll be honest with you, that, was not something that I anticipated when I launched the product. I had a, I thought that the sleep aid, it was something I was very passionate about, but I was completely confident. I was like, the pre-workout is going to be really good. The test, the test boost is going to be really good. And the sleep aid is going to be the worst seller. And I'm going to be trying to push it on people and they're not going to be interested. And actually what happened was the sleep aid ended up being our bestseller along with the test booster. Um, which I'm very happy about, and but the, you know, a big part of that is because it works. But it's also, I think, because I've tried really hard in a lot of our marketing and messaging to to explain to people. Most people could see a significant improvement in their health, their well-being, their performance, and their body, just their, their actual uh, body composition just from getting consistently good sleep like people are we have we have normalized an appallingly bad sleep uh level of sleep quality in modern society and i'm guilty of it too like when i go i've had you know i'll have a phase i'll go through a, a phase every now and then for like two or three nights in a row i don't get a good night's sleep and i'll be like oh i'm not sleeping well again like and everyone's got to get a nighttime routine. Yeah. Uh, you got to get, try to get a nighttime routine. You know, look up some of the things that really aid like restful sleep. So, like, um, I'm fortunate enough now, we've got a sauna at the house now. So, I, I, one of my favorite things to do is to, is to go in the sauna and then get immediately out of the sauna and go plunge in the pool, in the cold pool, like, or go take a cold shower. And, you know, you can do that in the morning and it wakes you up. But if you do it at night too, it also helps you sleep because that cold, you know, that you know, reducing your core temperature and giving you that cold rush and then recovering from that cold puts your body in a, in a, in a sort of recovery mode, 
you know, we're like, okay, we're ready to, we're ready to rest and recuperate now. Uh, shutting off your devices, making sure the room is dark, like really shutting out unnecessary light, phones and clocks and TVs and, you know, night lights and stuff like that. Like getting, like really getting it dark in there. And yes, taking a sleep aid if necessary to help get that melatonin release and, and you know, relax and switch off. Um, and a morning routine. Like I'm a big morning routine guy. So my, my days in the middle of the day are very fluid. Like, like today I've spent all day in my office, but that's rare for me. A lot of the time I'm not in here at all, you know? Um, but my mornings are pretty, I try to make my mornings, at least when I'm at home, my mornings are pretty, pretty regimented. It's like, I get up, make Donovan's breakfast. I have my coffee. I read like, five to six pages of whatever I'm reading at the moment, like maybe meditate if there's time or listen to music or something like get Donovan off, off to school. Then I get my, then it's for me, it's like I either swim or I do some sort of cardio, you know, and then it's my, and then and if I haven't meditated already, that that's when I'll meditate. And then I kind of sit down if I, if sometimes I've done it the night before and I've got a little checklist of like, this is, these are the things you must accomplish today, you know, uh, or sometimes I write it there and then, but it's like, I write it down, you know, that's another, it's, it's I'm a, I'm a serial list maker. Uh, I don't always do them all, but it's just a, anything to take the pressure off yourself as far as making that commitment to doing something writing it down is a really simple way to get it out of your head and into your action. Like, you know, I know I've got to do this and I've got to do that. But if you just keep saying it, it's way less likely to get it done. But if you sit there and write it down like this first, like sometimes I'll, sometimes this stuff I've procrastinated on, sometimes I'll write down nothing else until this is done. You know, like discipline yourself. Like, you know, yeah, be, big rocks big rocks first i have that as my mantra on my desk every day yeah be your yeah. be your asshole coach you know mm -hmm. like you 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 don't get to do anything fun until you do this you know like just little you know stuff like that so and it's like i'm a work in progress it's it's every day's a new you know i'm learning new stuff all the time and applying new stuff all the time and i uh, you know certainly not um you know i, I feel I feel like a bit of a fraud, even sort of sharing some of this because it's like, who am I to say it to anyone? But uh, I'm just applying sort of principles I've learned from other people, mostly, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Nick, how can um, our audience stay in touch with you? Where, where do they go to learn out more, more about you and Legacy? Well, Legacy Sports Nutrition is very simple. It's LegacySups.com. So Legacy, S-U-P-P-S dot com um and then i'm on uh, on twitter at real nick Aldis, on instagram at nick Aldis. i'm verified on both so you can look for the little blue tick and um all of my yeah any any uh, any between those three things you should see more than enough of me to to <laughs> get what you need to know um and uh i'm if you reach out to uh, legacy subs the chances are it's going to be me who gets back to you sometimes it might be mickey or it might be um it might be our assistant but it's, most of the time it's going to be me so I, I try my best to be available as much as i can great well thank you for being so available today thank you for um covering your career and life's journey so comprehensively um and as i say at the start of the episode love to hear everyone's um feedback and comments using hashtag good journeys pod across socials um and you can keep in touch with us on instagram at second mountain comms and at facebook and twitter at second mountain uk um so that wraps us up for today he's been nick oldis i've been ben veal this has been the good journeys with second mountain podcast thanks for being with us today and let's keep climbing together <laughs>